is Israel or the U.S. American leaders themselves do not believe that Iraq possessed such weapons. This is well documented. Iraqi leaders went on major American television before the bombing began in 2003. They were on major shows, uh, I, I forget their name, but ma ma uh, Walter Cronkite and people like that. I had this all documented in my book. They went on major television shows and said explicitly, we have no such weapons and we are not planning any such weapons. And yet the U.S. went ahead and bombed them. And, and you know, some people, I, I've heard American people in the media say, well, if they didn't have such weapons, why didn't they just tell us? <laughs> I swear, that's what they say. I, uh, w w I, w did they want us to bomb them? Why didn't they tell us? We, we, we would have stopped. Finally, lesson number six the, the, of the Cold War. There was never any such animal as the international communist conspiracy. There was and still are people living in misery in the third world who <coughs> rose up against their oppressive governments, governments supported by Washington. Time and again during the Cold War, the U.S. intervened to save these oppressive governments, even though the Soviet Union was not involved at all. Or, or the U.S. overthrew a government simply because it was leaning towards socialism. Like Cuba, that's, that's why we are still enemies of Cuba. They, they present a, a viable alternative to the capitalist system, and this is a sin we cannot forgive. Fifty years of the most terrible sanctions and punishments. So th and those sanctions continue to go on. How we doing, everybody? I'm also muted. You're muted. I'm muted. Everyone's muted. Are we muted? Oh, fuck. Here we, here we, here we go. Yeah, right there. There we go. Okay. All right. Now I'm not mu muted. Muted. You're not muted. We're all good. Nobody's muted anymore. Nobody's muted anymore. You What's going on, Chad? Let Mr. Bloom finish his sentence there because uh, Godzilla is a little bit curious about whose sanctions he was referring to. The Cold War was not actually a conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. It okay. was a conflict know. between the U.S. and the Third World. All right, that's fine. All right. Hopefully that answered your, your question there, Godzilla. Well, yes, you did. You did see me, Johnny Dialectically, on LFV this morning. Uh, yeah, I've been, like, you know, doing a lot of, uh, rushing around, you know, trying to get the word out, right? Uh, we are subversive history, right? Me and Pat. And we are a multimedia community project seeking to bring attention to the revolutionary struggles of the world's often unsung and frequently misunderstood sectors. These are the stories of the demonized, vilified, whitewashed, or otherwise forgotten campaigns against imperialism, colonialism, capitalist exploitation, and racial apartheid. The orthodoxy of Western hegemony has often labeled these dissidents as subversive, and these are the struggles we aim to illuminate. And it's also where we get the name. Oh. Godzilla, if you're into that, hang out and, uh, and listen um, to a little bit of factual information because we're going to be going over specific revolutionary movements in the third world. And what is, is Italy considered Western Europe? No, right? Um, it's like it, it's, it's, it's kind of like Turkey is like potentially European or potentially Asian um, slash Middle Eastern. It's like Italy, like depending on who I, I, I would imagine that depending on where it fell during um, the Cold War, it would have been like like now that it's like a NATO. Um, a NATO member, it's probably considered Western Europe and especially because Europe, it's definitely brought into the fold of like favorable European nationalities as opposed to the. Uh, 
the abominable hordes of the East, which are still to this day demonized quite a bit. Um, but I guarantee you that if it would have fallen into its, you know, more logical trajectory of socialism following World War II, that it would be, um, you know, held in the same regards as you as other as Slavic nations, I'd say. I mean, like, yeah, if we're going to consider like, I mean, even Slavic, right? I'm sorry. I got to plug in my wired connection. I, I have to oh, run this. OK, yeah, I'm, right. I'm already it's already choppy. I have to run this cord downstairs <laughs> and plug it into the modem. So uh, keep. Keep the talk up for a we're, second. We're good. We're good. Socialism isn't logical. See what happened to the Soviet Union? Yeah, I did. Did you? Yeah, do you know? Why don't you give us an estimation of what happened to the Soviet Union? Yes, yeah. you you tell you, us. You give me a one-sentence estimation about what happened to elaborate on that. Please, please. Sentence, please. I please, I beg of you. Uh, I have never... We probably have about six... I would say that we have about 16 hours... 16 <laughs> hours worth of content actually analyzing that specific event. So please tell us. Yeah. Too bad. Gorbachev was the smarter communist. How did, how did co capitalism go for Russia? Did that work out? Well, were the nineties, a period of prosperity Were the two thousands, a period of prosperity, uh, um, is life expectancy or overall population better in Russia now than it was during the Soviet Union? That's a deflection. It's a deflection of what you're you're trying to talk about how how uh, disastrous socialism was and capitalism has been like just objectively um, disastrous for the Russian people. Yeah, actually, if you could, I would appreciate that. All right, go go run your wire. It's it's honestly, I doubt it's going to be anything of substance that's even worth reading. No, it's okay. I'm having a good time. This is kind of waking me up a little bit. <laughs> um, that's not what aboutism. You're, we're, we're obviously talking about a dichotomy between uh, socialism and capitalism here, and we're trying to establish which one may be objectively more beneficial for the people of whatever given nation we're discussing. And I think in the case of Russia, one is like over like many, many metrics, uh, social metrics, more beneficial for the people than the other. And that would be socialism over capitalism. And if you want to call it, I don't even understand how that, I'm not even talking about what about -ism. I think he probably heard it on like a, what is it? Uh, what's, what's the little guy? Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, thank ben, you for talking. Can you explain how is that even what aboutism? Like, are you just like yeah. pulling words out yeah. of like a dictionary of debate terms and just yeah. kind of trying to throw them at me? And you're deflecting. That's what aboutism. It's like <laughs> I think I'm. Uh, it's either destiny, Vosh, or fucking. Yeah, uh, one is work. One communism being shit doesn't mean transition to capitalism has to be utopia because what. Both can be bad, although ostensibly transition to capitalism was better than communism. You could criticize the government. Arts were it opened up. It wasn't better. You can look up, you can look up um, um, on most social metrics that you would define like as like, if a country is doing well. And it's doing worse on most of them. And I'm not just saying that like both can be bad. I'm saying one is objectively worse in the case of Russia. And especially other like post-Soviet nations as well. So yeah, I'm not saying that like one is, oh, uh, they're both bad. So both bad. I'm saying one is objectively worse. We can, it bears out in the data. Right. So has, uh, has the Congo <laughs> benefited from capitalism? Yeah, bro. Tell me, tell me how the Congo has benefited from capitalism, Godzilla. Thank you. Thank goodness the Mumba didn't get to implement oh, any so, of his strategies. So, so McDonald's is the metric by which we are viewing capitalism. Capitalism is when McDonald's. Capitalism is when McDonald's, everybody. Capitalism is when McDonald's. You see those golden arches, you know capitalism is there. Not a metric, but in an example. What do you think a metric is? What the, what metric would I be substituting? These aren't substituted me metrics. This is reality. This is data. I don't even. I don't think you're actually saying anything. I think you're just stringing words together to hope that it's coming to get coming off to someone as a, you know, a cogent point. 
<laughs> you did me. I got the. I got the commie streamer. What does substitute your own metric mean? Like just make up numbers? I don't even understand what the fuck that that seems supposed to mean. So the Congo doesn't have banks. It doesn't have businesses that operate under a capitalist system. Oh, yeah, right, right. yeah, they they don't have if that. Private ownership. The the um the main mode of ownership in the Congo? Cogent point! You still not understanding how you deflected the original argument about USSR being shit into crying about transition to capitalism. No, dude, you're the one that brought well, up transitioning to capitalism. Shit, if you say something is shit, you can only compare it to the alternative. So it's like, was there problems in the USSR? Sure. Has capitalism been better? No. That's my point. You're the one being utopian if you're just like trying to bring up some idealistic solution. Mode of ownership is the private property. No. Are there markets? No. Is there a functioning government? Beep. Wrong. That, Sorry, there's, there's, markets, there's, there's, there's no markets market. in the Congo, bro. Oh, there's yeah. no gold market in the Congo. What? What are you talking about? Yo, they've achieved communism. They've achieved communism. Yeah, the, the, com no more, the, the commodity form has been abolished. He, the specter <laughs> of Lumumba rises over the fucking Congo right now, everybody, because they got McDonald's yeah. and communism. communism. Yeah, communism has been achieved. There's no McDonald's and <laughs> no commodity form. Uh, the Congo is our communist example. All those Canadian mining companies are, uh, that's actually communism. I mean, our, like God, Godzilla. Like you're, you're more than you're more than welcome to start your own stream, Godzilla. Like you know, and you can like you know say whatever you want and whatever voice you feel like. But we like be patting ourselves on the back a little bit, but most people are just making fun of you. Yeah, literally all of chat is just <laughs> fucking <laughs> mocking you relentlessly. Dungeons. <laughs> This is fun. I'm glad we got to do this. This is a, I've had a really busy day. I've had, I've been working with doubt myself. Like, you know the new place that I just signed a lease for and everything. And this, this has really been this is really the kind of uplift that I needed to start the stream. I feel energized now. Doubt um, myself. The debate bro. The debate bro in me has been fed. <laughs> His your bloodlust has been satiated. <laughs> what was my original defense of the USSR? Yeah, did we even defend the USSR? We've only talked about the USSR. And the Congo, but that's on me. Yeah, okay, true. What was my original defense of the USSR? That it was better before the, the, capitalism? The, yeah, I, I mean, on that. I, yeah. I think I've... I think I've um, I think I've been pretty emphatic on that point. Literally, over, by over. by every capitalist metric, the the Russia under the Soviet Union was more prosperous. Whether we're going to be talking about like you know just human metrics of like healthcare, education, uh, you know other things like that, um, or we're going to talk about just like you know its method of production and its ability to produce things. Yes, more prosperous, Godzilla. Open up a fucking book. How, what do you think Russia is like today? What do you think Russia didn't was have like supermarkets? Now? How would that? How would they have all that footage of empty supermarkets if they didn't have them in the first place? Do you think they just made them to be empty? The fact of the matter is, even by CIA documentation, um, the average Soviet citizen in the 80s was eating more than the average individual in the United States. And that was not the case after the turn to capitalism. After there was shock, uh, uh, economic shock therapy that pretty much rocked the nation into poverty and alcoholism and suicidality and all the other things that a very sick society turns to. <laughs> and you, I think you misspelled poverty when yeah, you said really, prosperity. I was, really, I was really going here. So this is something that Burn. I we have. If you go to our YouTube channel, um, somebody please bring up the YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, and then you can go to the Black Shirts and Reds discourse. And like I said, we have about sixteen hours worth of where we um, where we go into primary sources, secondary sources, data points, events, um, where we go over all these things too. So. Also, if you comment on the YouTube videos, I will never, ever fucking read them. So go <laughs> go ahead. Like, you know. Your only defense of the USR is to go back to capitalist transition. Well, Ca what is define capitalist cr transition? I want you well, to, to define that. You're not wrong. Obviously, we're comparing one mode of production to the other, and one was objectively better. I'm sorry if that upsets you.
Oh, I'm sorry. You must have some kind of mistake here under, like, whose stream you're in, good sir. And I'm assuming you're a sir. So, let's just uh, take care of that. How the fuck do I... I just want to mute him for a minute. How the fuck do I do that shit again? Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Oh, let's go for... Mm, one hour. Alright, wired connection is in. Oh, you timed him out? That's good. Yeah, just give yeah. them a time to think about what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, that was fun, though. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. It's funny you should mention Czechoslovakia. Tell us about Czechoslovakia. Yeah, because what are we at? 34 messages were deleted by a moderator. Was there something? Uh, oh, it's probably. <laughs> no, I just timed him out. I, because, like, you know, he's like, you know, oh, I that like you, Seb. When you, when you time somebody out? Probably. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, the Velvet Revolution was, was a big thing. Um, you know, I've heard, I've, I've read both sides of that issue. I would certainly say it's contentious. Um, which is the one that um, Vijay Brashad states coined the term tanky? Was that Czechoslovakia or Hungary? I think it was Hungary. Okay. So that uh, by, by uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, by Czechoslovakian standard, um, by Vijay Brashad standard, who's an author I respect very highly, he states that there was a greater um, criticism to this USSR for the Czechoslovakian situation than the Hungary situation, where the Hungary situation was more fascistic and the Czechoslovakian one was a little bit more understandable. Um, and uh, yeah, and and in the um, zero citizens killed, that's the same situation in Poland. Um, when the, when Poland broke from the USSR, there was also zero people killed, which was a point brought up by Michael Perenni, where he kind of brought up the maybe lack of totalitarian ideology that there wasn't like brutal reprisals to the secession of either Poland or Czechoslovakia. So um, that's a, an interesting point to take in. Um, did Czechoslovakia suffer from any any like market reform um, throughout the nineties after they broke from the USSR and they changed their their government? I'm just curious. We did a whole thing on this. Um, you know, I can't remember. Every, I'm not an expert on every single post-Soviet country, nor am I even really an expert on one of them. Um, but you know, <laughs> when we read over black shirts and reds, we did look over that. Nope, it was completely fine. I mean, I'll I'll say this as, you know, a, I think a common refrain here on this Twitch stream is that, like, we're not experts, right? We read the books, all right? And we're going to default, like, you know, the expertise, right? Um, you know, and the research, like, to the books that we're reading. Do you, do you agree, Pat? Oh, I absolutely agree. So there wasn't an industrial lag, like I'm reading here. I'm not saying that it was um, insane. I'm just trying to pull up some of the things that I that I talked about for that. Um, yeah, and I'll I'll uh, if you're from Czechoslovakia, I'll defer to you um, on that. We don't exactly have like a wealth of information here on Czechoslovakia, so. Maybe one day we'll discuss it. Um, appreciate your uh, your contribution there. What do you say we get into the regularly scheduled discussion today? Oh, let's see. I'm curious if there's a Czechoslovakia thing in here. I'm just curious. It, there might not be, but I just I'm want to look and see if there is. I'm pretty sure there might be. We do mention Czechoslovakia in yeah. this chapter. In the Italy um, one, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Which is an interesting um, uh, kind of uh, comparison to... Uh, the things that they accuse the Soviet Union of. I'm not seeing a chapter on Czechoslovakia. Okay. Yeah, there may not have been. 
I was just curious because we got to let them know that they can come in during that. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, uh, stick around because uh, when we get to the Italy chapter, I know that Czechoslovakia does come up. Um, Patakin says, I have three audible credits today. Can I get some book recommendations to listen to? Have you ever read The Divide, Potato King? Yeah, we love that book. We, we, that, we, that's almost like economic law yeah uh, yeah i would really recommend that book it's Highly. so good and so much information is packed into one book um in terms if you're interested in like the economic history slash development of the world um that is super good but if you're in like a if you're in a different topic you can maybe propose the topic that you might be interested in i might be able to uh, give you a specific book or johnny might because i know he knows a little bit more theory than i than i do and i might know a little bit more international history than he does um, in terms of book recommendations, that is. I would say if you really want to know about like theory, right, and you're into like Marxist theory, um, I would say check out this book if you can find an audio version of it by Maurice Cornforth, right? This book is amazing, and it's literally like um, almost like a school book kind of in how it like you know teaches uh, dialectical materialism. Um, there's that. I think like you know if you want like history, Gerald Horn is great um we kind of went over the counter revolution of 1776 but i think his other uh around the same time as that one was released i think it's called the dawning of the age of the apocalypse it's a long title like that um i think that that one would be really good because i think that's a more of a prequel to 1776 it's from like 1619 to 1776 yes we're from the united states yes we are not canadian <laughs> We don't teach that shit. We don't, we don't teach that at all. <laughs> there is no teaching of the Battle of Stalingrad in the United States, at least in public schools like high school. Um, oh. In uh, maybe in college, if you're in like a college level history course, that may come up. But even then, it's glossed over pretty um, uh, tenuously. Um, all right. It wasn't until I started getting into communism that I learned that Stalingrad was like literally the turning point of all of World War II. And it was like the deciding factor of if we would have a fascist Europe um, or not. Right. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. Yeah, no, so, the, the, the U.S. is, uh, as we'll see during this book, is far more interested in teaching an American centric story of World War II. Yes. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Pat. I was saying nothing. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so again, we um, we step in to our first sections of Killing Hope. I know there were some people in chat that was interested in reading these along with us. If you're with us now and you didn't hear it before, we do have all we do have this book available in PDF form in our Discord. So if you're interested in following along with us, please feel free. We encourage this very much. Um, we are getting, we did our introduction on Wednesday and now we will be getting into the first two sections, which is China in 1945 through 1960, a area that is titled was Mao Zedong just paranoid? We'll find out. And then Italy from 1947 to 1948, which is titled free elections, Hollywood style. Um, again, this is killing hope by William Bloom, which is U S military and CIA interventions since world war II updated today edition a book that is um interestingly recommended by both noam chomsky and osama bin laden <laughs> uh no two noted historical figures <laughs> <laughs> so uh this brings us to china uh starting in 1945 for four years numerous america i i don't I, i'll bring this up now i have some issues with william blum's writing style um he he's all over the place like he goes yeah. from like a very like fast and loose to very academic in well, like and a single this, chapter. This first sentence for four years, numerous Americans in high positions and obscure. Like what does that mean? Harbored the conviction that world war two was the wrong war against the wrong empires. Like I had to reread that. And I actually had to go into my physical copy of the book to make sure that the PDF didn't have some like error, but right. it didn't. It like, maybe he means the positions were obscure and also high. I don't know. It just seems like a kind of a weird. They, they uh, were uh, nefarious. Jackson, no Jackson, Jason Hickel. Is the is the author Jason Hickel, and that author. is that is not the MAGA communism guy. Just just making sure. All right. <laughs> um, so, for four years, numerous Americans, whatever high positions and obscure, suddenly harbored the conviction that World War II was the wrong war against the wrong enemies. 
communism, they knew, was the only genuine adversary on America's historical agenda. Was that not why Hitler had been ignored, tolerated, appeased, aided, so that the Nazi war machine would turn east and wipe a Bolshevism off the face of the earth and once and for all? It was just unfortunate that Adolf turned out to be such a megalomaniac and turned west as well. But that war was over. These Americans were now to have their day in every corner of the world. The ink on the Japanese surrender surrender treaty was hardly dry when the united states began to use the japanese soldiers still in china alongside american troops in a joint effort against the chinese communists in the philippines and in greece we shall see the u.s did not even wait for the war to end before subordinating the struggle against japan and germany to the anti-communist crusade so this is a theme which we discuss a lot here we discussed it a lot in our reading of black shirts and reds it's something that i'll bring up quite a bit um that Fascism may not have always been um, public enemy number one to those of the West or particularly the United States. Communism, as we have especially seen in the introduction where the Red Scare was going on since 1919, was far more um, uh, an agitation to United States or Western geopolitical interest. Um, in 1919, there was no... Um, nazi scare there was no fascist scare in fact there was the international jew by henry ford being distributed with the protocols of zion that was also being disseminated by white russian by white russian i mean the white army white army russians in fascist russians essentially in the united states um these things were being widely distributed while bolshevism was being um uh you know criticized and attacked and black people were being murdered due to nebulous associations with this perceived Bolshevism, yep. same as Hitler did to Jews. Um, this is what we're seeing. And then obviously um, we're going to learn a little bit more about the str strategic aims of the United States in terms of the Nazi communist conflict. But the United States has no scruples with joining forces with its once public enemies um, as allies against communists. And you can see this all across the board, whether it's in Nazi Germany, in the construction of the West German nation. Um, you can see this in Greece with the Nazi collaborator government. You can see this in Japan, whether it be in Japan itself, whether it's in Korea, whether it's in China. Um, the United States was very, very willing to work alongside um japanese fascist can, can we call japan fascist right that's yeah, not like talking I, I, about, I, right? I, that's, I not really, a, that's not abuse of the word fascist and so imperial japanese fascists um against communists and leftists of all colors right um they did this in am i am i forgetting it in italy they also did this in italy which right. we'll get to as well so um because right. i i think that like the the one thing that like should not be forgotten is who who is going to be more willing not just to kill foreign enemies, right? But even their own people in the name of anti-communism more than a fascist, right? right. And uh, the the one the two things that I think like you know just for the the rare uh, leftists you know in the West that doesn't know who the White Army was, they were loyalist to the former czars, right, mm -hmm. of uh, Imperial Russia, and uh, the, Ford literally stocked. Ford dealerships, the most commonly sold car in America with books about the international Jew and the protocols of the elders of Zion. Right. Now, imagine if you put uh, the Communist Manifesto on there. Right, right. His, yeah, his exactly. buildings would have been burned down. <laughs> by, by, um, yeah. Literally so, would have yeah. had the feds knocking down every single Ford dealership across America. And uh, Addie Morrow, uh, so cool to see two young U.S. guys. Thank you. Thank, thank uh, you for um, calling me young. That a bigger picture and afterwards from opinions and gain knowledge. Thank you so much. Yeah. And not, not to criticize other streamers, but here we, you know, we don't play video games on stream here. We don't do kind of like just like tool through Twitter headlines. Um, we pick books that we believe are reputable sources of information, especially as it pertains to history. And we do like very in-depth um, um, breakdowns of them chapter by chapter furnished with additional sources, additional information, just to kind of corroborate what, what's said in the book. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, please hang out. It's great to have you, and I appreciate the discussion. And every Friday, we like to hang a little bit loose. Uh, no video games still, and no other stuff, but like, you know, we just let our ADD run wild, and it's normally just geopolitical bullshit anyways. So, yeah. you know, three days a week, 
The communists in China had worked closely with the American military during the war, providing important intelligence about the Japanese occupiers, rescuing and caring for downed U.S. airmen. But no matter, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek would be Washington's man. He headed what passed for a central government in China, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, forerunner of the CIA, estimated that the bulk of Chang's military effort had been directed against the communists rather than the Japanese. He had also done his best to block the cooperation between the Reds and the Americans. Now, his army contained Japanese units, and his regime was full of officials who had collaborated with the Japanese and served the puppet government. But no matter. The Generalissimo was as anti-communist as they come. Moreover, he was born American client. Does that mean he was born in America? Is that what he's trying to say? He was a born American client. I just mean that he just has like through and through all the qualities of an American client. Right. This this whole thing was kind of worded a little weird, but his yeah, his forces would be properly trained and equipped to do battle with the men of Mao Zedong, and uh, that's the only time I've ever seen Zhou Enlai's name spelt with a C. But yeah, yeah Zhou Enlai. Um, President Truman was upfront about what he described as using the Japanese to hold off the communists. It was perfectly clear to us that if we told the Japanese to lay down their arms immediately and march to the seaboard, the entire country would be taken over by the communists. We therefore had to take the unusual step of using the enemy as a garrison until we could airlift Chinese national Chang's troops to south and send marines to guard the seaports. So if you're just hold on. so if you're at all like see I'm somebody that's read between 10 and 15 books on Korean history and if you're at all maybe even if you just listened through the uh, blowback series on Korea I have not um you would see something extremely familiar in this uh dynamic here. Um, this is precisely the same game plan that was utilized in Korea. You have Chiang Kai-shek, who is essentially the equivalent of Sigmund Rhee, yeah. who is like a autocratic, um, corrupt bastard in pretty much every sense of the word. Yes. Um, who really was more power hungry, as ruthless as any you know enemy of the United States, quote unquote enemy of the United States. Um, would would abuse power, would imprison people, would murder people, would conduct massacres. Yes. Um, and would also just like raid the coffers of the nation for his own personal wealth. Yes. Um, and also they would utilize who was just the oppressors a year ago or less than a year ago to maintain their hold on the country, which scorned the population so deeply because, you know, there was resistance fighters who were looked upon as heroes. You know, in um, Korea, this was Kim Il-sung, and in China, this was Mao Zedong. Um, you know, everyone that lived through China in terms of the peasantry and the citizenry, um, you know, was deeply, deeply disappointed and resentful of you know, one side being extremely now essentially teaming up with the people that were literally brutalizing them. And like, you don't have, you can look up what Imperial Japan did to China. Unit um, 731 should be gonna, a, enough of get, a Google term. We're going to get to Unit 731 in just a few minutes. So, um, I think that like for anybody that, you know, is watching this, it's questioning, well, why would anybody side with this dickhead? Is that prior to this, all Chiang Kai-shek was really concerned with was, you know, um, basically centralizing power away from warlords, literal warlords that were paid and bought by foreign countries like France, England, Germany, you name it, right? They had their own warlord that they kind of paid money to to try and uh, control regions of China to basically, if you look up old political cartoons, just carve up China yeah. into slices of their own. And if you're aware of Chinese history, everything prior to the revolution is referred to as um, the, the 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 century of humiliation. You know what I mean? The time of the Opium Wars, the time of Japanese imperialism. Um, so when and a lot of this was blamed to foreign entities such as the West and such as Japan. So when you see a large military force of nationalists siding with these two entities, you can imagine the resentment that comes out of um, you know a, a large portion of the population in China. Now. If you saw in the beginning there, the first, can you go back to the slide? Okay, it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, no, uh, actually, I need to do one real quick thing anyway. So let me just put that on us just for a second. And uh, what were we going to do? 
Um, if you saw the first sentence there, that in China they actually worked alongside the American military, just like Mao Zedong, just uh, just as in Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh, and just as in Korea with um, Kim Il Sung. Right. All of this happened in the Philippines, and I believe in Malaysia also. There was plenty of like very radical revolutionary resistance forces that fought alongside the Americans because they had a common enemy in the Japanese. This also happened in Greece alongside the Nazis. Right. Um, so, you know, there was the allied structure, as you could call it, where these communists and otherwise like resistance, anti-colonial fighters were teamed up with allied forces such as Americans or British people or things like that. Um, so you can see here that there actually was a very friendly relationship between the United States and the Chinese forces at one point. So if you go forward here, there's this thing. Have you ever heard of the Dixie mission? I have not actually. So this is a pretty interesting thing that I wasn't aware of, but this is there's a book by one of the guys that was involved with this that he cites in his sources there. Normally I wouldn't use a CGTN source here, but actually I think all the information in this is pretty solid. In 1944, China was at war with Imperial Japan and divided internally between the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by Mao Zedong. Washington felt confident Japan would soon be defeated, but saw a civil war between the communists and the nationalists on the horizon. The nationalists had the support of the United States, but the U.S. wanted to know more about the communists, who were proving to be effective guerrilla fighters and rapidly gaining support in the countryside the Pentagon decided to make official contact with the communists, sending a plane to their base in Yan'an. On board, a group of American soldiers and diplomats officially called the U.S. Army Observation Group, but unofficially known as the Dixie Mission, a reference to the southern states in the U.S. Civil War, since the Americans considered Yan'an, quote, rebel territory. Zhao Ma is professor of Chinese history at Washington University in St. Louis. Their primary focus is just to understand what is going on behind the, uh, behind the enemy lines. Along the way, they are able to even uh, have a better sense of how communism mobilizes people. The U.S. observers okay, lived cool. alongside the communists, meeting with Mao and other leaders many times. Most of the original members of the Dixie Mission stayed in Yunnan for about six months. A smaller group stayed through 1947. John Peyton Davies and John Service were the primary diplomatic observers. Both were born in China to missionary parents and grew up speaking Chinese. How were they received by the communists? They show very strong interest in hosting this group of American observers. And they show their willingness to work with Washington, or at least to have some kind of a, a good working relationship with Washington. They arranged Americans to talk to uh, the communist military and the civil leaders. The Dixie mission came to a controversial conclusion. The communists would likely win the coming civil war, and the U.S. should establish ties with the CPC. I reported uh, on the communists uh, after my visit there, that uh, I thought that they would probably win in China. Uh, and uh, the reason I think that that would happen is that they had the popular support. In a letter to Washington, John Service wrote, quote, This popular support gives the communists political power, which will make them a continuing and potent force in China. This is a fact which American policy must take into account. But back home in Washington, their recommendations ran into growing anti-communist sentiment. The Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was taking shape. The so-called Red Scare was on the horizon. Charles Ray is a retired U.S. diplomat. He was stationed in China in the 1980s. You know, my view that that mission was doomed to failure before the planes ever took off because senior people in Washington were just basically not prepared to get in bed with, quote, communists. Those diplomats who went in with that mission came back and reported what they saw accurately and honorably. This is what we think is going to happen. And when it happened, they were blamed for it. Not only were their recommendations ignored, several of them were blacklisted, driven out of their careers and investigated by the FBI. Wow. John Service was arrested in 1945 over allegations he revealed his reports on China to journalists. 
A grand jury declined to indict him. They were accused of the communist sympathizers. And by the same time, what they did is just tell the truth. The communists were victorious and the People's Republic of China was established in 1949. But the U.S. had no official contact with the PRC or the Communist Party until the 1970s under U.S. President Richard Nixon. The way this country has dealt with China through the centuries, we've always been a day late and a dollar short in figuring out who the Chinese are and what it is they want. The cost of ignoring the Dixie mission? Years of potential cooperation lost. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. Do you hear the ice cream truck in the background? No. <laughs> was that a Chinese ice cream truck or is that my... No, that was, in, that was in Washington. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so... um. What we can see here is like, you know, any kind of like concept of like a rabidly anti-American uh, communist force in China, as well as in Vietnam, as well as in um, Korea, none of these things happened. All three of these countries were perfectly ready to engage in friendly dealings with the United States, so long as they were able to exist and determine the own trajectory of their country. Obviously, none of those were afforded that luxury. Um, thus, you know, bringing us to the bitter rivalries that many of these countries have today. Uh, what was I just about to say? And we're going to see this further elucidated uh, later when you see CIA operatives that are that are that are captured in China. Um, that their treatment of these individuals was probably not great as they were imprisoned, but they weren't like executed in town square or anything like that. So the main thing I wanted to continue on here is the evidence of using Japanese troops, which in my opinion is the greatest insult to the people of China that could ever be um, issued at this time. Would you agree, Johnny? Yeah, that's and it's utilizing disgusting. Japanese troops in any kind of like way other than like imprisoning them, executing them, uh, you know, any of these types of, you know, forms of corporal punishment. I think that's the only way that you could really deal with Imperial Japanese troops at that time. Um, not use them for your benefit against the most popular resistance force in the country that was fighting against them. Would you agree with that estimation? It would be like using uh, German Wehrmacht in like Israel, like yeah, exactly. in 1946. It, it was, like that is like almost a one to one. Um, that is like almost a one to one comparison. Like that is not hyperbolic whatsoever. If you look at what the Japanese were doing in China, that is not a, a, a hyperbolic. They were well. literally committing human experiments on Chinese yes. people. Yes. So here we have a uh, New York Times um, article. Uh, U.S. to aid Chang to win Manchuria. The communists have charged for weeks that the government planned an offensive aimed at Kalgan, their big new base, and said that there have been concentrations of government troops, former puppet troops, and some Japanese troops for this drive. So far, the nationalists do not seem to indicate definitely anything more than an expanding of their protective screen north of... Dude, like, Americans are just so brain dead in terms of, like, knowing the name of any place. No. So back then, they <laughs> like... call it Pai Piping, and then they're going to call it Peking, when in reality, it was always Beijing. Right. It, it, so, like, you're going to have to deal with this a lot. We're, like, three steps removed from what this place is actually called, but Piping, which is Beijing... Um, through something bigger, may, though something bigger may be in the offing. So go forward one. Well, at least like, I, I think if, if we go pay ping, that's like kind of close. It's that's almost a B. It's, it's like. Yeah. Okay. So now this is an excerpt of uh, Harry Truman's memoirs. Uh, you want to read this, Johnny? Sure. We therefore had to take the step of using the enemy as a garrison until we could airlift Chinese national troops to South China and send marines to guard the seaports. So the Japanese were instructed to hold their places and maintain order. In due course, Chinese troops under Chiang Kai-shek would appear. The Japanese would surrender to them, march to the seaports, and we would send them back to Japan. But this operation of using Japanese to hold off the communists was a joint decision of the state and defense departments, which I approved. So here we have in Truman's own memoir that he approved the use of Japanese troops to uh, hold off the communists, who, again, based on all testimonies and evidence that we have, were the most popular, um, uh, you know, governmental force in china at this time right needed to be held off by nationalists supplemented with um not only japanese soldiers but marines also right so again 
to maintain order. Just like China's example, this is as if after Germany surrendered, you had Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht troops be, like being like, hey, can you uh, keep these Jews in line? over here we i know we have this jewish town over here can you just keep them in line because they're actually uh you know partisans and they were actually fighting with communists alongside communists so and the, the vermont would probably say yes we're actually very skilled at keeping jews in line. <laughs> we're actually perfect for this do, do you want to so, know what like the well, most I mean, fucked up part is that like a lot of people tend to think that like oh world war ii started in like 1942 or 41 or something right yeah. no dude world war ii started for china in like 1929 right so this is here more evidence of the use of Japanese troops and Marines to uh, bolster the nationalist army of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, let's move forward here to the next slide. Just want to make sure I got that date right. <laughs> Go, is this you or me? Um, do you I'll take read. it if you want? Yeah. Okay. The deployment of American Marines had swift and dramatic results. Two weeks after the end of the war, Peking was. I'm just gonna say Beijing. Anytime it's says Peking or Peking, <laughs> I'm just gonna say the word Beijing, and I hope everybody can just follow along with me. Was surrounded by communist forces. Only the arrival of the Marines in the city prevented the Reds from taking it over. And while Mao's forces were pushing into Shanghai suburbs, U.S. transport planes dropped Chang's troops in to seize the city. In a scramble to get key centers and ports before the communists, the U.S. transported between 400,000 and 500,000 nationalist troops by ship and plane all over the vastness of China and Manchuria, places they could never have reached otherwise. As the Civil War heated up, the 50,000 Marines sent by Truman were used to guard railway lines, coal mines, ports, bridges, and other strategic sites. Inevitably, they became involved in the fighting, sustaining dozens, if not hundreds, of casualties. U.S. troops, the communists charged, attacked areas controlled by the Reds, directly opened fire on them, arrested military officers, and disarmed soldiers. The Americans found themselves blasting a small Chinese village unmercifully, wrote a Marine to his congressman, not knowing how many innocent people were slaughtered. So, a couple things to go over here. If you know anything about the Korean War... Korea had almost like completely uh, the Korean forces of the north or as you could call them you know I forget which what 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 actual label they fought under but the DPRK let's call it or the right. PRK or whichever label you want to give it the, pretty the, much eventually like, became kicked, the DPRK yeah kicked the shit out of Sigmund Rhee's um you know little puppet government right and it was not until the United States got involved that they were pushed back what was it that it was it the Geola pro province or was it the I don't remember it precisely on the map. Push them back up to the 38th parallel, 37th parallel. The 38 I or 39, since, I think. Since I opened these books. There's one in Vietnam and there's one in, in Korea. But regardless, very similar here where the communist or socialist forces were the dominant and most popular forces in the country. Yes. They would have won handily quickly and handily if it was not for any kind of like foreign intervention. The United States provided that foreign intervention and made this much more of a battle than it would have been without any artificial interference. Right. Um, so now we can see Marines by their own testimony, um, unmercifully blasting Chinese villages and killing who knows how many innocent people. So will you go forward um, one slide? Please? Oh, and I stand corrected. I looked it up. Uh, Japan invaded China in 1937, but I do know that they had been colonizing Korea since at least what the 1920s right no since the 1800s since the 1800s all right it was like 1880 that they they did their coercive treaty jesus christ um so here is um some excerpts that i found from a congressional record um this was a marine speaking out on his activities in china at, for the house of representatives uh in 1946. so let me read these because i kind of have them all out of, out of whack here but so we can see this one this first one under the the main title we moved up a few shots came from the small village Kerr heavy 81 millimeter mortars were set up and the smaller 80s were set up and we proceeded to blast this small village in the changwang tao area unmercifully two men innocent or guilty were cut down by machine gun fire as they ran from a burning house how many innocent people were slaughtered in that small village is still unknown to us who did the slaughtering if the germans or japanese had done this who'd scream about the brutality of it first a little slur in there that i did not just read you know just to just to put it out there i'm glad you yeah. uh you know <laughs> um so then we have up here let's start at the top 
The American people have been told that we would not actively assist the nationalists in their struggles with what has become commonly referred to as the communist forces. But today, among the arms carried out by the Chinese national forces can be found in large numbers American Grand Rifles, mortars, flamethrowers, Tommy guns, and even American pack howitzers, all of which are being turned against communist forces in undeclared warfare. American ships transport central troops, American planes control communist patrol communist territory, United States troops guard coal trains transporting coal for government use, bridges which are strategic only to the nationalist cause, power plants, property of the central government. Perhaps all this is not actually assisting the Chinese nationalists in their internal struggle against the commies, but if it isn't, perhaps you can tell me what would be assistance. And then lastly, I am a bazooka man with the 7th Regiment, 1st Marine Division, and have not personally participated in the disarming of any Japanese, and have not seen the actual disarming of any Japanese, and know of no member of this regiment who has done either. So, here we have uh, more evidence of, one, the type of brutality that the Marines were using um, to inflict damage upon Chinese villages. Two, we see further uh, evidence of the Japanese troops not being apprehended, disarmed, uh, deported from the country or anything like that. And three, we see a, a long record of things that the Marines were doing to assist the Chiang Kai-shek Chinese nationalists. Right. And mortars are just indiscriminate weapons where it's just, yeah, like, they're not very precise, especially not at all. I would imagine that you just point it at a building or a populated area and just let explosives fly. That, that's the one where you just kind of like, you know, drop the grenade in the tube and then it shoots out of the grid, you know, out you of ever the use tube. a potato gun. Anybody in chat ever use a potato gun? Hell yeah, brother. It's kind of like that. Uh, even worse, at least like a potato <laughs> gun. It's like on your shoulder, you know, yeah. like this shit. Nah, it's just, boom. The American same. <laughs> I made so many. I, I would hope you have. How do you think <laughs> I got my nickname? The American soldiers in China began to protest about not being sent home. A complaint echoed round the world by other GIs kept overseas for political, usually anti-communist purposes. They ask me too why they're here," said a Marine lieutenant in China at Christmas time, 1945, as an officer. I am supposed to tell them, but you can't tell a man that he's here to disarm Japanese when he's guarding the same railway with armed Japanese. Strangely enough, the United States attempted to mediate in the Civil War, this while being an active, powerful participant on one side. The U.S. Yes. loves to do that. In January 1946, President Truman apparently recognizing that it was either compromise with the communists or see all of China fall under their sway, sent General George Marshall to try and arrange a ceasefire and some kind of unspecified coalition government. While some temporary success was achieved in an on and off truce, the idea of a coalition government was doomed to failure, as unlikely as a marriage between the Tsar and the Bolsheviks. As the historian D.F. Fleming has pointed out, one cannot unite a dying oligarchy with a rising revolution. Which is a great quote. And um, so, again, here's more Marines saying that as an officer, I'm supposed to tell them, but I can't tell a man he's here to disarm the Japanese when he's guarding the same railway with armed Japanese. So just kind of further adding more and more evidence onto the absolutely abhorrent use of imperial japanese troops to control communists and peasants who are sympathetic with the communist forces oh and by 1949 united states aid to the nationalists since the war amounted to almost two billion in cash and one billion worth of military hardware 39 nationalist army divisions had been trained and equipped yet the chang dynasty was collapsing all around in bits and pieces it had not been only the onslaught of Chang's communist foes, but the hostility of the Chinese people at large to his tyranny, his wanton cruelty, and the extraordinary corruption and decadence of his entire bureaucratic and social system. By contrast, the large areas under communist administration were models of honesty, progress, and fairness. Entire divisions of the Generalissimo's forces defected to the communists. American political and military leaders had no illusions about the nature of quality and of Chang's rule. The nationalist forces, said General David Barr, head of U.S. military mission in China, were under the world's worst leadership. The Generalissimo, his cohorts, and soldiers fled to the offshore island of Taiwan, Formosa. They had prepared their entry two years earlier by terrorizing the islanders into submission, a massacre which took the lives of as many as 28,000 people. 
Prior to the nationalists' escape to the island, the U.S. government entered no doubts that Taiwan was a part of China. Afterward, uncertainty began to creep into the minds of Washington officials. The crisis was resolved in a remarkably simple manner. The U.S. agreed with Chang that the proper way to view the situation was not that Taiwan belonged to China, but that Taiwan was China. And so it was called. So here we see, again, this is just like Korea, again, where the U.S. officials, like, have no, you know, no illusions of Chiang Kai-shek, just like with Sigmund Rhee, that they are absolutely a piss poor leader. They are not popular. Overall, they're just like kind of stupid and corrupt and just real assholes, but they're anti-communist. So we will support them. We will give them money. We will give them guns. We will give them military support so long as they are anti-communist, despite they are utterly incompetent and corrupt in almost every way that a leader should not be. Um, this is not this was not unknown to the to the United States. It's not like they had some kind of like benevolent misconception that this was actually going to be the best thing for the Chinese people. So then, luckily, unlike Korea, where the half of the country had to be partitioned to serve as this U.S. Uh, or Western client state, um, they got off easy with just the island of Taiwan, which as they said, um, was taken brutally by force by Chiang Kai-shek, which really um, demonstrates the brutality that the KMT were willing to engage in. And then also that China, uh, that the U.S. forces and Chiang Kai-shek also were under the impression that Taiwan was China at that time, that that's how they would right. get around with this issue of still potentially vying for control of the mainland. This, this tiny island off the coast. But yeah. so, uh, go forward one. so you're 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 someone that's aware of the White Terror, correct? I believe so. Sorry, I got kind of distracted because I wanted to find out if General David Barr was at all related to William Barr uh, or Donald Barr. I don't know if you know who either of those people are. No. Uh, Donald Barr is uh, the former headmaster of the Dalton School in New York City, where uh, Jeffrey Epstein got his start, and William Barr was at one point the. Uh, what, what, what is it? Oh, he was also the office of strategic OSS officer. Um, okay. and then his son was also like the, the guy that was under like Trump, you know, and all that other stuff and George H. W. Bush. So, um, if you've never heard of the white terror, first of all, the white terror was the, um, the atrocities committed upon the people of Taiwan during KMT rule. But something that I had never heard of was um the 228 incident which was actually what preceded the white terror so they're not even in power yet so first thing just bring up the 228 incident because this is something that is actually separate the no, wikipedia no, thing or that thing that thing all right just mute that cc that this year marks the 75th anniversary of the 228 incident the worst massacre in taiwan's recent history as many as 30,000, mostly local Taiwanese, are thought to have been killed over three weeks, including almost an entire generation of Taiwan's elite. Previously, Taiwan had been a colony of Japan for 50 years, but following the defeat of Germany and the Axis powers, Japan was forced to surrender Taiwan. 228 occurred in the second year of the takeover of Taiwan by Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Republic of China, which later lost the Chinese Civil War and retreated to Taiwan. The massacre was triggered on the 27th of February when government officers beat a woman they accused of selling contraband cigarettes. They then opened fire on the surrounding crowd. On the 28th of February, angry citizens marched on the governor's office and were fired on together with innocent bystanders. Riots spread within days across the entire country. Taiwan's six million people had initially embraced the ROC's nationalist party, the Kuomintang, as liberators from the Japanese. But endemic corruption brought the country to its knees. The once rich island nation endured high inflation, unemployment, and was on the brink of starvation. These were the underlying conditions of 228. The incident's scars remain today. Hmm. So now let's go to the white terror, which if that wasn't enough this is what this kind of brings us to here so let's just do the first three paragraphs unless you want to do more but read over these first three paragraphs here for me 
The White Terror was the political repression of Taiwanese civilians under the Kuomintang-ruled government. The period of White Terror is generally considered to have begun when martial law was declared in Taiwan on 19th of May 1949, which was enabled by the 1948 temporary provisions against the Communist Rebellion, and ended on the 21st of September 1992. Jesus 1992 trivia here that is the longest period of martial law that has ever existed in the history of government um if you read the book um asia's unknown uprisings part two um they go into this how that was um the literal longest period of martial law that has ever existed in all of organized government in the history of the world from 1949 to 1990 what was it 1991 there's never been a country taiwan has existed under Ty and under martial law for a longer period than any other country on earth and also i think that that video we watched didn't necessarily bring enough light to it no. that the white terror is an anti-communist um crusade so it was not like the nationalists went over there and they're like oh great you're here to save us from the communists there was an, an immense communist rebellion to the nationalist forces that were oppressing them thus constituting the world's longest martial law in history and massive reprisals and executions against the people let's continue into the next and you know it was used against more than just communists Oh, of course. Just go down and read it. With the repeal of Article 100 of the Criminal Code allowing for the prosecution of anti-state activities, the temporary provisions were repealed a year earlier on the 22nd of April 1991, and martial law was lifted on the 15th of July 1987. The period of white terror generally does not include the 228 incident of 1947, in which the KMT killed at least 18,000 Taiwanese civilians in response to a separate. popular uprising. They're two different situations. They're related, but they're not technically the same. Right. And also summarily executed many local political and intellectual elites. I was laugh at that term the two are frequently discussed in tandem as it was the catalyst that motivated the kmt to begin the white terror martial law was declared and lifted twice during the 228 incident following the 228 incident the kmt retreated from mainland china to taiwan during the closing stages of the chinese civil war in 1949 wanting to consolidate its rule on its remaining territories the kmt imposed harsh political suppression measures which included enacting martial law executing suspected leftists or those they su suspected to be sympathetic towards communists others targeted included taiwanese locals indigenous peoples who participated in the 228 incident such as uh oingu yeah, i'm no nah, i'm sorry i'm going right. to bastardize that shit it's but fine. And those accused of dissidents for criticizing the government. So, yeah. So, really, I just wanted to do those first three chapters. Like, we could obviously read through. This is a whole thing. Yeah. I have a whole book called Formosa Betrayed that actually goes into a lot of this. That would be fun to cover on stream one day. But, you know, I just wanted to really let it be known. See, kind of what we're – the picture that we're trying to paint here of the KMT is that they were brutal. They were oppressive. You know, anything that, you know, the United States is holding up as them as being some kind of, like, beacon of democracy and freedom um, is absolutely contradicted by the way that they um, treated uh, Taiwan. Taiwan was not some island of fucking um you know capitalist glory uh it was the longest martial law dictatorship that has ever existed in the in, in the world in recorded history go ahead what are you saying here Just read out what you want to i'm, I'm lost uh, with the national revolutionary army heavily dependent and inspired by the german military mission during the sino-german cooperation 1926 to 1941 until adolf hitler decided to withdraw in 1938 to align with imperial japan so it's just like you know uh, yeah no we're cool with everything they were doing uh you know up until they decided to you know side with the japanese it was them but not right. us you know we you know we were pretty satisfied right. with the relationship is what i'm reading so obviously Taiwan's a whole issue, but right now we're really just trying to bring this up for the KMT. You right, I mean? right, 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 right. We're right. painting a picture of who Chiang Kai-shek was, who the KMT was, and thus who was Mao fighting against, and it was these people. Kind of seems like he was a bastard, not going to lie. Seems like a real piece of shit. In yeah, my yeah, it kind of seems uh, like a very few redeeming qualities. I agree. All right. So now we're going to Burma, which is a new fold in this history that I was not aware of before, but there's going to be a very interesting detail here. So please listen to this because I, this blew my mind. Many nationalist soldiers had taken refuge in northern Burma in the great exodus of 1949, much to the displeasure of the Burmese government. 
There, the CIA began to regroup this stateless army into a fighting force, and during the early 1950s, a number of large and small-scale incursions into China were carried out. In one instance, in April 1951, a few thousand troops accompanied by CIA advisors um, and supplied by airdrops in the American C-46s and C-47s crossed the border into China's Yunnan province. But they were driven back by the communists in less than a week. The casualties were high and included several CIA advisors who lost their lives. Another raid that summer took the invaders 65 miles into China, where they reportedly held a 100-mile-long strip of territory. While the attacks continued intermittently, the CIA proceeded to build up the force's capabilities. American engineers arrived to help construct and expand airstrips in Burma. Fresh troops were flown in from Taiwan. Other troops were recruited from amongst Burmese hill tribes. CIA air squadrons were brought in for logistical services, and enormous quantities of American heavy arms were ferried in. Much of the supply of men and equipment came in via near nearby Thailand. And I think that this is like kind of like a important thing to keep in mind when you think of the China Taiwan um conflict. You know, after you've already established, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and the repression that he the white terror and, and all that, you also must keep in mind that immediately after that, Taiwan became a landing base to fly US operatives into mainland China, which is like, you know, which is grounds for warfare in any, you know, sense. This would be like if Hawaii or Cuba or something like that was like, um, used, was just flying in operatives and military supplies for a war against the United States is, is, is what that's, what's that right. similar to. Um, so we see that happening here and we're going to see that happening a lot more. So keep that in mind. Okay. Read this part. This is where it gets really interesting. In between raids on China, the, oh my God, the Chinats as distinguished from the Chai comms found time to clash frequently with Burmese troops, indulge in banditry and become the opium barons of the golden triangle. That slice of land encompassing parts of Burma, Laos and Thailand, which was the world's largest source of opium and heroin. CIA pilots flew the stuff all over to secure the cooperation of those in Thailand who were important to the military operation as a favor to their nationalist clients, perhaps even for the money and, ironically, to serve as a cover for their more illicit activities. More illicit than trafficking heroin and opium. That's, wow. The Chinats in Burma began uh, kept up their harassment of the Chai comms until 1961, and the CIA continued to supply them militarily, but at some point, the agency began to phase itself out of uh, more direct involvement. When the CIA, in response to repeated protests by the Burmese government to the United States and United Nations, put pressure on the Chinats to leave Burma, Chang responded by threatening to expose the agency's covert support of his troops there. At an earlier stage, the CIA had entertained the hope that the Chinese would be provoked into attacking Burma, thereby forcing the strictly neutral Burmese to to seek salvation in the Western camp. In January 1961, the Chinese did just that, but as part of a combined force with the Burmese to overwhelm the nationalist main base and mark Fini to their Burmese adventure. Burma subsequently renounced American aid and moved closer to Beijing. For many of the Chinats, unemployment was short-lived. They soon signed up with the CIA again, this time to fight with the agency's Grand Army in Laos. So let me ask you a question, Johnny. Have you heard of a little thing called the Opium War? Uh, why, yes, I have. I, I, I have indeed. Have you heard of multiple Opium Wars? I know there was like two, I right. want to say. Two. That's what I was aware of. I was aware of two pretty significant opium wars. Can you move forward one slide, please? Surely, surely. Have you ever heard of the Opium War of 1967? What the fuck? That's no. what I said. Why don't you go ahead and read through this real quick? Do we want to click the, the link itself? No, no, no. no I, just, I was just putting just that just this. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, just, Marooned in fun. the vicinity were the remnants of the nationalist Chinese army loyal to the Kuomintang that had been stranded there when the Chinese Civil War ended in a communist victory. That was in... That was in 1950... That was in 1949. That was in 1949. <laughs> Although Young recruited... Uh, some of the nationalist Chinese soldiers to the Royal Lao Army's 101st Special Battalion, French uh, Battalion Special 101, the BE 101, 
Many others became involved in the opium trade, although they were funded by the Republic of China for Which inte- Taiwan. Yeah, if Taiwan. Anybody, no, that, that should just say Taiwan. <laughs> for, for, for Taiwan. For yeah. intelligence activities and espionage, their money was cut off in 1961. Wow, it only took them like 11 years. Yeah. When the KMT generals shifted to opium trading, they claimed it was as a necessity to fund their armies. In short order, the KMT troops soon controlled 90% of the Burmese opium. Still maintaining their military capabilities, including a radio net for communications and weaponry that include crew-served weapons such as a 50 cal machine guns and 75 millimeter recoilless rifles, the KMT would move caravans of 100 to 600 pack mules loaded with raw opium without interference. Their largest shipments contain nearly 20 tons of raw opium fucking year is it they charged a transit tax on the opium they handled or protected so i know that this is a little different this is a little bit in the future and this is in lao as opposed to burma but like really what this is is just like an overwhelming amount of evidence that yes the kmt was absolutely just engaging in opium trade like like you know what i mean like i you know you know that's what william bloom is stating in the book there's sources for that but then also you can even just look at the wikipedia page that this was going on for i guess decades um after the 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 some of the kmt forces broke into burma and then into lao but yeah so definitely selling heroin also i'll be right back i just gotta run to the bathroom real quick all right i'm gonna wait for you um you gonna wait for me well, I don't want to read it without. without all right, all right, all right, all right. I'll, be, I'll be right back. All right. What's up, chat? Hey, the Taliban did that too. Yeah, they did. I actually had a buddy of mine that went over to Afghanistan. Um, a guy I went to high school with, and there's pictures of him standing in front of uh, poppy fields and things like that that he had, where he was guarding the poppy fields. America's usurpation of OPEC was to no purpose. It seems as oil is now globally traded in yuan that's a currency of china why would they need to do this the godzilla guy was saying how awesome capitalism is yeah also he was um um kind of saying that he supported any revolution against socialism and that's why i was kind of hoping that they would stay around because you know essentially this entire book is just pointing out how absolutely despicable every like american supported um resistance group to like a socialist development is absolutely like the most like abominable and disgusting force imaginable you know utilizing like far more repressive tactics than whatever force that they were um, elected to fight against all right yeah, of course he was being a dick. Yeah, but we kind of we we clowned him sufficiently, in my opinion. Are we talking about Godzilla? Yeah, yeah, yeah not very Godzilla of him. He was kind of yeah, weak. Not, definitely was not the Godzilla of argument of no. argumentation for sure. No, kind of weak. So many incursions into China were made by smaller commando type teams airdropped in for intelligence and sabotage purposes. In November 1952, two CIA officers, John Downey and Richard Fechtu, is that, how would you pronounce that? Fechtu. Where the um, fuck is it? R- 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 Richard Fechteau. Yeah, who had been engaged in flying these teams in and dropping supplies to them, were shot down and captured by the communists. Two years passed before Beijing announced the capture and sentencing of the two men. The State Department broke its own two-year silence with indignation, claiming that the two men had been civilian employees of the U.S. Department of the Army in Japan who were presumed just lost on a flight from Korea to Japan. Just, just, uh, how, you know, whoops, you know what I mean? They just happened to um, fall out the back of a plane, yeah. all right? Like... <laughs> How they came into the hands of the Chinese communists is unknown to the United States. The continued wrongful detention of these American citizens furnishes further proof of the Chinese communist regime's disregard for accepted practices of inter- international conduct. Please cue the Curb Your Enthusiasm music. Uh, that was released in December 1971, shortly before President Nixon's trip to China. Downey was not freed until March 1973, soon after Nixon publicly acknowledged him to be a CIA officer. Fucking, you know what's like really funny is that this is like the third fucking time in history that I can think of off the top of my head where a CIA plane is like shot down, but anytime before that, it's just outright denial that it's even happening. There's Indonesia, right? 
There's uh, well, it happened in Russia. It happened in Russia. All right, so that's four right there. There's another one in um, what the fuck is it? Nicaragua, right? Where they shot oh, down yeah, a CIA was plane. Much shot off Iran Contra is is yeah. that guy that got shot down? Yeah. yeah, it was considered a conspiracy theory until that guy got shot down, and like he had his like CIA like you know fucking like employee fucking badge on, and they're like, yeah, we know you work for the state government. He's like, yes, I do. Now please help me get back home. Somebody's throwing out N-word accusations in chat. What? I'm not going to tell Wilco what they can and cannot say. Is Wilco? Yeah, I, I don't know anything about that person or what. Uh, Let me put it to you this way, right? Uh, what the fuck is it? Uh, Marcus has been with and, and met like Wilco in real life. So I'm oh, going okay. to assume... Right. Yeah. What? I think essentially what you're saying is that if like a black person says a certain word, I'm not going to tell them that it's inappropriate. Transspecies. Do do you think that like that that a, a white person should be allowed to say it? It seems that the implication is that they're white or something, because otherwise it's a non-issue. Because I know Wilco ain't white. But uh, feel free to answer that question. <laughs> Are you mad because you can't say it too? Is it one of those things? Is, is, that, is that what you're getting at? I just think no one should be able to say it. Is that, is that what you're getting at? <laughs> Account created nine minutes ago. All right, that's what I thought. All no right, we've, we've bye. The, we've reached the, <laughs> the matter. <laughs> we've uh, we've we reached the crux of the matter. All right, I there we go. <laughs> being straight banned, like that's not the thing. Like I think Godzilla was like fine to keep around if they just want to have like a little stupid discussion. But like that person, like bringing that, like just ban that. But that's not even like it's not even what we discuss. It's just no. Yeah, they made their thing nine minutes ago. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I, also, like, what do you think of this little thing? I've been trying to get this to work for, like, so many streams now since we started using OBS. Do you like this? What is it? It's it's the chat box, but instead oh, yeah, it's, like, on it, stream. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I love it. You can make it a, pu a public event of banning people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a purge to the masses. Exactly. Um, okay, so, yeah. And speaking of uh, execution in front of the masses, let's take note that China did not execute the cia officers that it found frequently behind Dude, that's the another board. thing what which like is something that like really isn't even like that condemnable like if someone is like in your country doing outright espionage i'm not saying that you should just like be executing people wantonly but you understand that if somebody's like there to like foment like absolutely like you know deadly uh you know coercion within your country it's not out of the realm of possibility, but they just like imprisoned him. And then once the United States finally gave up and was like, yeah, so those were CIA agents. And I'm like, okay, here you go. You, you just, ha you know what I mean? Like, take him back. So long. Here's your goddamn agents back. Um, which kind of flies in the face of like this narrative. That's like China has always just been like this rapidly anti-American or just like, if they were, those dudes probably would have had bags over their heads, brought out into Tiananmen square and like, filleted before the masses right like think about how many fucking other times it, just in our lifetimes alone where like you know a foreign agent a foreign agent like acting under like you know pretty much the uh the auspices of the u.s right has been captured in another country like venezuela yeah they're never executed i know ever i know so, right, so now we're getting some fun stuff. Go ahead. In the mid-1950s, the CIA began to recruit Tibetan refugees, and I tried to find my Mao already free Tibet shirt, and I just I couldn't find it, but whatever. Uh, began to recruit Tibetan refugees and exiles in neighboring countries such as India and Nepal. Amongst their number were members of the Dalai Lama's Guard, often referred to as picturesquely as the Fearsome Kamba Horsemen and others who had already engaged in some guerrilla activity against Beijing rule and or the profound social change being instituted by the revolution. Serfdom and slavery were literally still prevalent. I, that's not... I think, that that's, been, I think that might have been like a... Like a, like a um, um, 
like a, a go break. in the PDF, but I didn't fix it because yeah. I was like, no, we're going to keep that. No, one. It, that it's one. it's in my PDF too. I remember reading. I was like, yeah, literally, literally. still prevalent in Tibet. Mm-hmm. All right. Those selected were flown to the United States to an unused military base high in the Colorado mountains. I've been there. An altitude approximating that of their mountainous homeland. There, hidden away as much as possible from the locals, they were trained in the fine points of paramilitary warfare. If you go to Colorado, you can still find like a lot of like Tibetan restaurants and stuff like that, and a lot of like Tibetan heavy like stuff out I there. I YouTubed um, like Colorado Tibet because I wanted to see if there was like a like a video on it, and I got like I literally couldn't even find anything because there's just so much about Tibetan communities uh-huh. in Colorado. Like apparently, mm-hmm. there's a ton of them out there. Mm-hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> After completing training, each group of Tibetans was flown to Taiwan or another friendly Asian country, thence to be infiltrated back into Tibet or somewhere or elsewhere in China, where they occupied themselves in activities such as sabotage, mining roads, cutting communication lines, and ambushing small communist forces, which I'm sure just is actually code for just villages of people. Their actions were supported by the CIA aircraft and on occasion led by agency contract mercenaries. Extensive support facilities were constructed in Northeast India. Don't go forward yet. Okay. Do you know the show Penn and Teller? Penn and Teller? Yeah. Yeah, with the, the, the guy that doesn't talk and the big fat loud guy that's like a hardcore libertarian. Are you aware of any kind of like special guests that they may have had at any point? Um, uh, uh, Michael Parenti? Please go forward a slide. I should have said the Dalai Lama. I I want this to to like be the saving grace for them, but it's really not. The purpose of our life is happiness. Ever since these Tibetans fled their homeland at the threat of the communist Chinese in 1959, their leader, the Dalai Lama, has been traveling the globe with a trite greeting card philosophy and a warm smile desperately trying to enlist help in his quest to free tibet and return to power i believe you see every human being have the potential to develop compassion this idea that he's a humble spiritual man with just a robe and a bowl and a prayer bead uh, isn't really what the dalai lama is all about i'm michael parenti a political writer, author, and noted after-dinner raconteur. I love him. He headed a social system that was exploitative, terribly, uh, terribly unequal, and terribly brutal. Tibet was Shangri-La. That is, if you were the Dalai Lama. No wonder he wants it back. He had a palace and a pile of servants. The rest of the Tibetans lived in huts and ate roast barley meal and yak butter tea. You had a privileged priest class living in utter luxury and opulence and you had a mass of serfs living in utter misery and if you broke the law then torture and mutilation including eye gouging the pulling out of tongues and even disemboweling were reportedly common punishments as this state department internal memo reveals the dalai lama at one time took hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year from the cia for his living expenses hmm. and one and a half million a year from the spy agency to finance tibetan guerrilla operations against the chinese which included running a covert guerrilla training center in colorado hmm. maybe they were non-violent covert guerrillas violence and telling lies cheating these i believe basically against human nature to be fair the robed one isn't taking money from the cia any longer once people found out it became a bit of a pr problem (laughs) so what would happen if the dalai lama returned to power in tibet if he had his way he would want the chinese out he would bring the lama class back it would be ruled by monasteries the aristocrats of the exile community would all go back with him and it would be like old Tibet with maybe a few reforms. So, so like, you know, yeah, uh, there's a lot you can say about Penn and Teller and like his like libertarian yeah, thing yeah, and everything yeah. like that. But like, that was just such like a perfect little two minute video that had Perenni in it. And I, I didn't even know Perenni was ever on that show. 
in really? 2005. It's so funny. It really just makes me wish that I was more aware of him back then. And I, I had a chance. I had an opportunity to see him speak live, you know, because I know, I know, I know. I, but the other thing is uh, that whole, like, you know, oh, people, uh, you know, running around Tibet, like killing people in the name of the Dalai Lama. Right. Do you remember that guy that we were without naming him, uh, that guy that we were going to do like a thing about India with? My, my friend no my friend oh yes 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 yeah so he actually has a cousin that like had to flee the country because like of of those people and that's right. why that it's actually from him that i learned that like nah dude like my family's from tibet fuck the dalai lama right yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i'm I, now i have to pee real quick and i'm sorry I'll wait. Do you want to no 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 i'll wait anyway you can hear Prince Charles is a massive pal of his fellow God on Earth. I mean, like, you, you know, that's the other thing is, like, hasn't he, like, completely, like, given up on, like, thinking that he's ever going to go back to Tibet? Like, I'm pretty certain that, like, you know, he's uh, made numerous conflicting statements, you know, in his, you know, long time in the public eye by now. But, like, uh, I'm pretty certain that, like, it's 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 never coming back around again, man. That gravy train is, is gone. Gone. I remember we had a Tibetan monk who was a former prisoner come to our school. On retrospect, it seemed like propaganda. I mean, look, I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, there's a lot about Buddhism that, like, I'm I, I'm indebted to that, like, kind of helped me through a lot of very dark times in, like, the last 11 years. I mean, that's why, like, you'll notice I have, you know, some tattoos that, like, you know, are, uh, you know, Buddhist in, in origin. Yeah. I'm not going to show my chest tattoo, but, yeah. you know. I'm actually a huge proponent of, like, the Buddhist spiritual philosophy in terms of, like, making sense of, like, human suffering, complacency, like, the desire to keep filling, like, holes with material things that will only last, uh, you know, temporarily. Like, it doesn't matter how much money you get, how many possessions you acquire, uh, you know, you will eventually become complacent with them. And, you know, you will learn eventually that this is, like, a futile quest of acquisition that never will fully give you contentment right um just things like that bring me comfort and like it's in one in one sense it's very pessimistic but also it's very liberating once yeah. you kind of start coming to terms with that so i don't want to get on we could talk me and johnny could probably talk about we could probably talk about it for hours. hours but like yeah. real quick i mean like if you ever want to if you're ever questioning like well, what does johnny believe real quick i like sufist ideas and conceptions of an all loving God and everything. And I love Buddhism for it's like lack of uh, desire for material gain. Right there. So you read through all this already. I did not. Um, no, what I did not. Oh, okay. I okay, waited for you. The Chinese devoted a great deal of effort to publicizing their claim that the United States, particularly during January, March, 1952 had dropped quantities of bacteria and bacteria laden insects all over Korea and Northeast China. It presented testimony of about 38 captured American airmen who had purportedly flown the planes with the deadly cargo. Many of the men went into voluminous detail about the entire operation, the kinds of bombs and other containers dropped, the types of insects, the diseases they carried, etc. At the time, uh, photographs of the alleged germ bombs and insects were published. Then, in August, an international scientific committee, quote-unquote, was appointed and composed of scientists from Sweden, France, Great Britain, Italy, Brazil, and the Soviet Union. After an investigation in China of more than two months, the committee produced a report of some 600 pages, many photos, and conclusions that, quote, the peoples of Korea and China have indeed been the objectives of bacteriological weapons. These have been employed by units of the USA Armed Forces using a great variety of different methods for the purpose, some of which seem to be developments of those applied by the Japanese during the Second World War. I'll go forward one here. I actually have snippets from that specific report. So here we can see directly from the report of the International Scientific Commission for the Investigation of Facts Concerning Bacterial Warfare in Korea and China. Since the beginning of 1952, phenomena of a very small, unusual character occurring in Korea and China. 
led to allegations by the peoples and governments of those countries that USA forces were waging bacteriological warfare. The International Scientific Commission, which was formed to investigate the relevant facts, has now brought its work to a conclusion after more than two months in the field. It found itself in the presence of a mass of facts, some of which formed coherent patterns which turned out to be highly demonstrative. It therefore concentrated its efforts especially upon these. The commission has come to the following conclusions. The peoples of Korea and China have indeed been the objective of bacteriological weapons. These have been employed by units of the USA, armed forces, using a great variety of different methods for the purpose, some of which seem to be developments of those applied by the Japanese army during the Second World War. The commission reached these conclusions, passing from one logical step to another. It did so reluctantly because its members had not been disposed to believe that such inhumane Inhuman technique could have been put into execution in the face of its universal condemnation by the peoples of the nations. It is now for all peoples to redouble their efforts to preserve the world from war and prevent the discoveries of science being used for the destruction of humanity. So this is a international conglomeration of scientists from the Western world, from the Soviet Union, uh, coming together and saying unequivocally that yes, the United States engaged in chemical warfare against the peoples of China and Korea. So uh, that's not a conspiracy theory. This is like a, a, essentially an agreed upon fact at this point. So let's move forward one. Just okay. bit the last record has to do with the bacteriological warfare experiments the Japanese had carried out against China between 1940 and 1942. The Japanese scientists responsible for this program were captured by the United States in 1945 and given immunity from prosecution in return for providing technical information about the experiments to American scientists from the Army Biological Research Center at Fort Detrick, Maryland. The Chinese were aware of this at the time of the International Scientific Committee's investigation. So let's open up unit... 731 just to give everybody a little bit of an idea of what was going on here and really i the, the main reason why i added this was because of the surrender and immunity section because i think that's really important to go over um if you want to just read the first part of it just to like kind of give everybody like what this actually was and i mean you literally could write there's entire books about the disgusting nature of unit 731 they like gave people frostbite they gave people they were there was raping there was murder there was disfigurement like any kind of like mendelian is that what you would refer to that as? Like Mendelian? Like Mendel? Who's the, the Nazi You mean Mengele. 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 Yeah. Mandela was the, the African guy. No, not not Mandela. I think I was saying Mendel, like the um, like the guy who did the P crossovers, the the the, the biologist. Um, um, but regardless. Ah. Um, Sorry. I, I wasn't just... getting it mixed up with Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I thought that's what you were getting at with All the Mandela. in chat and there as a biologist. Who is the... Uh, Poor Gregor Mendel. Yeah, that's what I was saying <laughs> by accident. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't... I, please don't ever think that I would get Nelson Mandela mixed up with this. Um, I fucking... Have you ever just been accidentally, like, chewing and you accidentally bite a hole through your lip? Yeah. Yeah, I just did that live on stream. Very so good, Very good. Uh, so just read the verse just to give an idea of, like, how... Like, so if for the United States to kind of like grant immunity to these people, let's really establish how disgusting that was as if just, uh, a, you know, utilizing Imperial J Japanese troops wasn't disgusting enough. Um, the experiments that were carried out, um, on the, J the, the Korean and Chinese people are just like stuff of like a science fiction horror movie, like things that you don't actually think transpired in the real world, but they did. Unit 731, short for Manchu Detachment 731, and also known as the Kamo Detachment, and the Ishii Unit, was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese Army that engaged in lethal human experimentation and biological weapons manufacturing during the Second Sino-Japanese War, 1937-1945, and World War II. The unit is estimated to have killed 200,000 and 300,000 people. It was based in the Pingfang district of Harbin, the largest city in the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo, now northeast China, and had active branch offices throughout China and Southeast Asia. Unit 731 was responsible for some of the most notorious war crimes committed by the Japanese armed forces. It routine, uh, routinely conducted tests on people who were dehumanized and internally referred to as logs. Experiments included disease injections, controlled dehydration, hypobaric chamber experiments, biological weapons testing, vivisection, amputation, and standard weapons testing. Victims included not only kidnapped men, women, including pregnant women, and children, 
but also babies born from the systemic sexual assault perpetrated by the staff inside the compound. The victims came from different nationalities, with the majority being Chinese and a significant minority being Russian. Additionally, Unit 731 produced biological weapons that were used in areas of China not occupied by Japanese forces, which included Chinese cities and towns, water sources, and fields. Estimates of those killed by Unit 731 and its related pro uh, programs range up to half a million people, and none of the inmates survived. Okay, that's all that 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 established enough context that we need. So now go down to the surrender and immunity part. Let's all keep that. Just place that in a nice little compartment in your head to just really think about how bastards, bastardly these people were. And then let's see about how that they should have been treated. Um, you know, and I'm not I, and I say this on stream all the time. I don't like gulag memes. I don't like, oh, liberals get the wall and anything like that. But these people should have been placed directly up against a fucking wall and just annihilated off the face of the world, of the earth. They, any other breath after committing these types of things is a crime against humanity that, that they enjoyed. So let's just keep going down. Or if you want to just like control F on the, uh, or go down, it's about to come up. Probably like, Easily the darkest fucking time of World War II. Probably maybe even the darkest in human history. Like, the, the, what was going on here is just, like, absolutely beyond imagination how terrible it was. Okay, surrender immunity. Here we go. Operation and experiments continued until the end of the war. Ishii had wanted to use biological weapons in the Pacific War since May 1944, but his attempts were repeatedly snubbed. Destruction of evidence... Um, while coming in the Red Army in August 1945, the unit had to abandon their work in haste. Um, go down a little bit. We actually want the American grant of immunity. This is what we want. Among the individuals in Japan after its 1945 surrender was Lieutenant Colonel Murray Sanders, who arrived in Yokohama, Yokohama uh, via the American ship Sturgis in September 1945. Sanders Sorry. was a highly regarded microbiologist and a member of America's Military Center for Biological Weapons. Sanders' duty was to investigate Japanese biological warfare activity. At the time of his arrival in Japan, he had no knowledge of what set Unit 731 was, until Sanders finally threatened the Japanese with bringing in the Soviets into the picture. <laughs> Little information about biological warfare was being shared with the Americans. So this is funny. This guy's like, what were you doing? What were you nothing. doing? You're, was, you're not going to tell me? You're you doing want me nothing. Stalin over here? No. You want, you want Stalin to come? No. Out? Then what were you doing? We were just doing some stuff with bugs. Keep going. <laughs> it's like... It's like do you want me to call your dad? <laughs> do you want me to call your father? All right, maybe we were <laughs> kind of like, kinda like no call chaining no call people yeah. in the cold, you know, maybe some stuff with some hyperbaric chambers and do some vivisection, dad. Maybe, know, dad. maybe some like, you know, diseases. So maybe. All right, so Sanders took this information. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, the Japanese wanted to avoid prosecution under the Soviet legal system. So the morning after he made this, his threat, Sanders received a manuscript describing Jap Japan's involvement in biological warfare. Sanders took this information to General Douglas MacArthur, who is the supreme commander of the Allied powers and responsible for rebuilding Japan during the Allied occupations. MacArthur struck a deal with Japanese informants. He secretly granted immunity to physicians of Unit 731, including their leader, in exchange for providing America, but not the other wartime ally allies with their research on biological warfare and data from human experimentation. American occupation authorities monitored the activities of former unit members, including reading and censoring their mail. The Americans believed that the research data was valuable and did not want the other nations, particularly the Soviet Union, to acquire data on biological weapons. Hmm. Uh, the Tokyo War, Tri War Crimes Tribunal heard only one reference to Japanese experiments with poisonous serums on Chinese civilians. This took place in August 1946 and was instigated by David Sutton, assistant to the Chinese prosecutor. The Japanese Defense Council argued that the claim was vague and uncorroborated, and it was dismissed by the tribunal president, Sir William Webb, for lack of evidence. The subject was not pursued further by Sutton, who was probably unaware of Unit 731's activities. His reference to it at the trial is believed to have been accidental. <laughs> Later in 1981, one of the last surviving members of the Tokyo Tribunal, Judge Rowling, had expressed bitterness in not being made aware of the suppression of evidence of the Unit 731 and wrote, It is a bitter experience for me to be informed now that a centrally ordered Japanese war criminality of the most disgusting kind was kept secret from the court by the U.S. government. 
While German physicians were brought to trial and had their crimes publicized, the U.S. concealed information about Japanese biological warfare experiments and secured immunity for the perpetrators. Critics argued that racism led to the double standard in the American post-war responses to the experiments conducted on different nationalities. Whereas the perpetrators of Unit 731 were exempt from prosecution, the U.S. held a tribunal in Yokohama in 1948 that indicted nine Japanese physician professors and medical students for conducting vivisection upon captured American pilots. Two professors were sentenced to death and the others 15 to 20 years in prison. Yeah, I have a so, funny feeling that if a lot more American soldiers were, you know, experimented upon, they probably would not have been able to get away as much as they did. So, John, you want to read the, what happened in the Soviet Union? Sure. Although publicly silent on the issue at the Tokyo trials, the Soviet Union pursued the case and prosecuted 12 top military leaders and scientists from Unit 731 and its affiliated biological war prisons, Unit 1644 in Nanjing and Unit 100 in Changchun. In the Khabarovsk war crimes trial, among those accused of war crimes, including germ warfare, was General Otozo Yamada commander-in-chief of the million-man Kwantung army occupying Manchuria. The trial of the Japanese perpetrators was held in Kabaravask in December 1949. A lengthy partial transcript of the trial proceedings was published in different languages the following year by the Moscow Foreign Language Press, including an English language edition. The lead prosecuting attorney at the Khabarovsk trial was Lev Smirnov, who had been one of the top Soviet per- prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. The Japanese doctors and army commanders who helped per- yeah, perpetrated the Unit 731 experiments received sentences from the Khabarovsk court ranging from 2 to 25 years in a Siberian labor camp. The United States refused to acknowledge the trials, branding them as communist propaganda. The sentences doled out to the Japanese perpetrators were unusually lenient by Soviet standards. And all but two of the defendants returned to Japan by the 1950s, with one prisoner dying in prison and the other committing suicide inside his cell. Get wrecked. In addition to the accusations of propaganda, the U.S. also asserted that the trials were to only serve as a distraction from the Soviet treatment of several hundred thousand Japanese prisoners of war. Meanwhile, the USSR asserted that the U.S. had given the Japanese diplomatic leniency in exchange for information regarding their human experimentation. The accusations of both the U.S. and the USSR were true, and it is believed that the Japanese had also given information to the Soviets regarding regarding their biological experimentation for judicial leniency. This was evidenced by the Soviet Union building a biological weapons facility in Sverdlovsk using documentation captured from the Unit 731 in, G- in Manchuria. I think there's a, something a little bit different from finding documents at this, the, the actual location. You know what I mean? Like It's saying that there was documentation captured from Manchuria, then like utilizing the actual people like you know what i mean like and i and i'll agree here that like um everything that i said about them these people needing to be put to death is absolutely true and i think you can probably criticize the soviet union of being somewhat lenient and maybe extracting some information out of these guys and allowing them to not just you know snack on a fucking bullet um and most of them did end up back in japan but that's a lot different than granting them full fucking immunity and then keeping them in the United States to essentially work in your like bioweapons department. Sorry, I was looking at the author who uh, this this little piece here is uh, cited from in the Biohazard, the chilling true story of the largest covert biological weapons program told yeah. from inside by the man who ran it. So yeah, we can go forward now, but yeah. Oh, it's another little video. Would you look at that? Is this CTGN? Or CG, CG, no, this is New China. Sorry. But just so you know, Xinhua is funded in whole or in part by the Chinese government. Not unlike our free press like the PBS, C-SPAN. Uh, our media is only funded by oligarchs. Yeah, yeah. Trustworthy yes. oligarchs. They would never lie to you.
the reports that I found came for me last year, the final piece of the puzzle. Central Intelligence Agency, the US CIA, as um, I'm part of their celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, released um, hundreds of documents that they held, previously had been classified, to the public. I found approximately two dozen of them. The kinds of pathogens we're talking about precisely for things like anthrax, plague, the bubonic plague, unbalanced or rabbit fever, acute fever, hemorrhagic uh, diseases of various sorts, cholera, dysentery, smallpox, possibly also used. Port Dietrich, of course, is in the center, is at the center and still is, of, of U.S. biological warfare research. And back in the early 1950s, they worked closely with the CIA as well. There was something called the Special Operations Division within Port Dietrich that worked on making a biological weapon two to three weeks after the first public accusations of germ warfare utilizing methods similar to Unit 731. The man who interviewed Ishii and other members of 731 was found dead in his hotel room. High-ranking people like okay, I'm not gonna lie. Whoever mixed this, you need to turn down the fucking yeah. theatrical music by it's like way too loud. five, ten percent at least. Trouble, Colonel Evans. They mentioned that you know how important it was to I've keep security that. around this issue. If anyone broke security on it, they would be put. How even the, uh, some of the pilots didn't know what they were flying. We have above a preponderance of the evidence now showing that the United States engaged in a biological warfare campaign. But I think we need to work with an international commission. And then we start to move on. And the only way to reestablish trust and restore the world where diplomacy and not saber rattling would be by settling the issue of past crimes. Okay, so yeah, so lots of documented evidence of what is only like a outright what it, when was the geneva convention put together was that that, that was probably after this right? uh, let's take a look i thought it was uh after world war one oh i could be i could be wrong too though but you know i'm looking at it uh bu, 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 bu. 1929 yeah yeah okay so just like probably the most flagrant violations of the Geneva Convention. Not that that's like anything new for anyone that like follows like real history of the United States, but you know, and obviously they continued to do this up until fucking they were supporting Saddam using chemical weapons against Iranians, um, but so on and so forth. The dead horse is beaten. <laughs> um, okay, this is you, right? All right. In March 1966, Secretary of State Dean Rusk spoke before a congressional committee about the American policy toward China. Mr. Rusk, it seems, was perplexed that, at times, the communist Chinese leaders seem to be obsessed with the notion that they are being threatened and encircled. He spoke of China's imaginary, almost pathological notion that the United States and other countries around its borders are seeking an opportunity to invade mainland China and destroy the Beijing regime. The secretary then added, how much is Beijing's fear of the United States is genuine, and how much of it is artificially induced for domestic political purposes, only the Chinese communist leaders themselves know. I am convinced, however, that their desire to expel our influence and activity from the Western, Pacific, and Southeast Asia is not motivated by fears that we are threatening them. So yeah, so that just really caps everything off here and just kind of like, you know, this is what, uh, you know, Secretary of State Dean Rusk is saying, like, you know, where the fuck do they get off acting like they're being encircled or invaded or that we're trying to destabilize them when we just painted like the most fucking, well, obviously not the most, you know, uh, you know, strenuously sourced. Obviously, there's entire books written about this, but I think in just the two hours that we've been talking about this, we have like... Uh, put numerous, 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 very credible examples of the United States doing exactly what he's like. It's like they're obsessed that they're being threatened and encircled. And like, meanwhile, <laughs> we have just fucking detailed exhaustively how much shit yeah. has been done in just two hour, a two hour stream. We probably have dozens of examples of this happening. Hang on. I'm, I'm bringing up the picture. Uh, okay. He's got to don't, don't make him tap the sign. Fucking no! This isn't even like the best one. Where where the fuck is the other one? It's uh, this one right here. Let's yeah. uh, let's open this up in new tab. Oh, motherfucker! Oh, there it is. 
No. God. Let's zoom in on it. This is why I do things. This is why I'm glad we have this view right here. Or it's just the cameras. Let's uh, take a look right there. <clears throat> yeah, no. Every other country does this shit too, right? Yeah. It's all, both sides are bad. Yeah, both sides. <laughs> both sides have, you know, bases all around other countries, right? Like, oh, God damn it. It won't let me fucking do the thing. Ah, whatever. Why would Ukraine yeah, joining NATO worry Russia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why, why would, why would any other country in the world think that, like, you know, the U.S. is the aggressor here? Both sides. Both, Both sides. sides. Yeah, <laughs> this. Every other country has this many bases around a country that, like, they're, you know, not trying to be the aggressor yeah. to. And like, you could also put like like conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan just to fill in that Western side a little bit more right. of like, you know, what I mean, like contentious issues that have to do with the United States all over the fucking place. Right. You know, or like, like the if we would have succeeded more, if we would have succeeded better in Iraq and Afghanistan, there would probably be a few more on the Western side as well. I'm trying to see if there's a more recent one too. No, I don't know, man. I think you, I think that one proved your point. Is, did it though? Did I really, I, I just want to make sure that like, you know, I, I've, I've gotten it down pat. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But all right, let's, let's move on, I guess. If you say so. Now this concludes our section on China. China and we're now moving on to Italy. So before we get into the actual period of the book, I kind of wanted to bring up just a couple things here to set up like a background of Italy. And one thing I noticed is that this period of Italy, specifically 1947 to 1948, is a very ill-discussed topic of history. Like yes. even searching for things on YouTube, there's like nothing. Like even this uh, uh, Garibaldi Brigade, the uh, only uh, thing that comes get, up- Garibaldi. Is the only thing that comes up when you search this on YouTube is songs. Yeah. Like there's like, like songs that like, like anthems of it and stuff like that. So let's go to that real quick. I just want to, this is really just kind of my point in this showing is, that. Uh, uh, the Brigate Garibaldi. The communists were the most, okay. So background information on Italy. There's this guy, his name's Mussolini and he was a real <laughs> dick. Okay. Um, just, just a really not cool guy. And during the period of time that he was in power, there was like a, a main, a common trend among the, among those that put forth a principled resistance to this uh, abominable dickhead. And that was the communists and the socialists. So just an example of that here is the Brigati uh, Garibaldi Brigade uh, were partisan <laughs> units aligned with the Italian Communist Party, active in armed resistance against both German and Italian fascist forces during World War II. They were mostly made of communists, but also included members uh, of parties of the National Liberation Committee, in particular the Italian Socialist Party, uh, led by Luigi Longo and Pietro Sicchia. They were the largest part. They were the largest of the partisan groups and suffered the highest number of losses. Members wore a red handkerchief around their necks with red stars on their hats. So um, we can, um, um, you know, we don't have to read through this whole thing, but like you can just go down a little bit. Let me see if there's anything else on here that was necessary. Go down. Go down more. Look at these so, yeah. Chad looking motherfuckers. Yeah, look at these guys. Yeah. So again, like like this stated, these are the largest and sustained the most losses out of all partisan forces. So it is somewhat understandable why they were so popular in the United in in Italy following the fall of fascism, or at least the perceived fall of fascism. Go down. I don't think there's anything else that we really need to do here. General yeah, Command. I mean, I mean, Commander of the Garibaldi group remains in Osala. The first and the left is Aldo Anianasi. Oh, he became a politician. That's that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, feel like that's it. Yeah. So let's go back to that that thing there. Now we're gonna bring up a quick little video here that's gonna be, that's gonna warm everyone's hearts. This is kind of gonna set us up, kind of like from the jumping off point. This is um, what's gonna fucking warm our hearts. Pat? Well, read the... What, is the, what does it say? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You ever seen a fascist hung from a meat hook before? <laughs> the Italians were not Hitler fucking around. The Second World War, and before was Benito Mussolini. Il Duce, as he was known, 
was the infamous Italian fascist dictator who took his country into the Second World War, closely allied with Nazi Germany. However, ultimately, like the German war effort, the Italian one faltered, and Mussolini was subject to an execution, which went down in the history books as one of the most brutal events of the Second World War. Can you pause it? Is it though? Occurred to his body. Yeah, I, I heard it like, in the beginning. Yeah. I was like, the death of this one guy was one of the most brutal events of World War. Was it two? though? <laughs> like, There's lots of stuff going on. Is, uh, Birkenau and Auschwitz. Like, you understand that this is like the the the. You, you understand that this was the, the time period that we're talking about. I don't know if you're just being hyperbolic for your little YouTube video, but like, come on, dude. Like, it takes like 10 seconds. I'm sorry, like a split second of critical thinking to be like, what? That And like, this was made a year ago. So it's like, <laughs> you know, you don't even. You have no excuse. Like, what? Aside from that one comment, this is a good video. Go ahead and put it on. I'm sorry. I just After it was like, displayed in Milan, Benito Mussolini was a man who Hitler himself idolized but his death and execution was one which reinforced a desire in Hitler's mind to take his own life in Berlin, rather than to be made a public spectacle of. So join us today as we look at the brutal Coward. execution of Benito Mussolini, Italy's fascist dictator and Hitler's best friend. And remember to support our bad. channel. Please make sure to subscribe. I think that might be a bit hyperbolic. Benito hyper Mussolini had been acting as the leader of Italy since 1922 as the prime minister and then the dictator a few years later and the fascist leader eventually took his country to war alongside the Nazis and his friend Hitler. Hitler. As part of the Axis forces, right. Italy backed up the Wehrmacht and the Nazis in many different theatres. Mussolini launched attacks on Greece and also offered his support to the Germans in North Africa, which resulted in a huge loss for the Italians. <laughs> many Italian soldiers were even sent to Russia to help during Operation Barbarossa in the Soviet Union, and thousands failed to make it home. The war for the Italians did not go well. They became short on supplies and heavy attacks against them heavily depleted their army. The Allies invaded Sicily in July 1943 and Mussolini was then deposed and placed under arrest before the Italians signed an armistice with the Allies. After this was signed, Mussolini was rescued by German soldiers in the Grand Sasso raid and Hitler then placed him in control of the Italian Social Republic, a German puppet state in the north of Italy. The Allies, however, continued to fight on and take control of many important Italian cities such as Rome, and they began to push north. Mussolini then arrived in Milan with the last remnants of his Loyalist army, looking like they were about to be defeated, and he considered his options. The Germans retreated out of the northern Italian cities, and the Italian partisan leadership, which were now running parts of the country, declared that any member of the former fascist government was to be sentenced to death upon their capture. Unsuccessful negotiations happened between the partisan government and Mussolini's representatives, and on the 25th of April 1945, he fled towards Lake Como. Mussolini was Lake now Como. on the run for his life, with the declaration meaning that he was almost certain to be killed once he was captured. Italians know on the 26th of April, Mussolini fascist. was joined by his mistress, Claretta Batacci, and they tried to cross into Switzerland, which would have helped to save his life. However, on the 27th of April, a detachment of local partisans attacked the convoy in which Mussolini and Batacci were part of near to the village called Dongo, and it was forced to stop. Within this group were other former fascist politicians, and the partisans recognised many figures in the convoy, but not initially Mussolini. The Germans were forced to give over all of the Italians for safe passage, and Mussolini was then found in one of the vehicles. One partisan who discovered him, Urbano Lazaro stated how his face was like wax and his stare glassy. I read exhaustion but not fear. He seemed spiritually dead. He was then arrested and spent the night nearby at some barracks before being reunited with his mistress early in the morning of the 28th of April. Intense fighting was going on around Mussolini's prison and he believed he would be rescued yet again by his supporters. It was then announced that Mussolini had been captured on Radio Milano with a partisan leader stating, We think an execution platoon is too much of an honour for this man. He would deserve to be killed like a mangy dog. Mussolini's death sentence then came, and it's unclear who gave the overall orders to kill the ex-fascist leader of Italy. Within Milan, a communist leader, Luigi Longo, allegedly gave orders for a communist partisan named Walter Ordizio to go and kill Mussolini and execute him. 
along with another partisan, Aldo Lampredi, they then the went to carry out the mission. There have been different accounts of how Mussolini and his mistress Patacci were executed, however the account of Walter Odizio seems to be the most comprehensible. The two left Milan for Dongo in the early hours of the 28th of April to carry out the orders, and when they arrived they arranged for Mussolini to be placed into their custody. Ordizio went in the disguise of Colonello Valerio during the execution, and they were then taken to a farmhouse where Mussolini was being kept to pick them up. Once Mussolini and Patacci were in Ordizio's custody, they Welcome drove back, to a Sam. village named Giulino de Mezagra. Outside of a villa named Villa Belmonte on a narrow road, Patacci and Mussolini were told to leave the car and stand against the wall of the villa. At 4.10pm, armed with his submachine gun, Ordizio shot Mussolini and his mistress against the wall of the villa. The accounts do differ as to how Mussolini was during the moments leading up to his execution. Ordizio paints him as a coward, but Lampredi does not, and also Ordizio states how he read out his sentence of death, but Lampredi said he didn't with Mussolini's last words being, aim at my heart. Some accounts also state how they were shot by a partisan firing squad, however the execution of Mussolini seems to be more hastily arranged. However, after the former fascist dictator had been killed, it did not end there for his corpse. Following his and his mistress's shooting, the bodies of them, along with other fascists executed, were taken by van to Milan. When they arrived in the city in the morning, they were dumped in the Piazza Loreto, a major market square within Milan. Previously, 15 partisans had been shot there, and their bodies had been left on public display, so for the partisans this was payback. By 9am that following morning, a huge crowd had gathered, and the angry Italian citizens spat at, urinated on, shot at, kicked and even threw vegetables at the body of Mussolini and his mistress. Even vegetables? It was a mob mentality, and Mussolini was heavily disfigured by the beatings, and the crowd was completely out of control. The bodies were then placed on the metal girder frame that was above, and the corpses were hung upside down on meat hooks. This was done to show the disgrace of the fascists, but it was another way to protect the bodies from the mob. At 2pm on the 29th of April, the Americans arrived in the city and took the bodies down, and they were driven to the morgue for autopsies to be carried out on the remains. One autopsy on Mussolini showed the brutality of his execution, with him being sprayed with nine bullets from the submachine gun, with another stating he was shot seven times. Four bullets had been aimed at his heart, and these were the fatal cause of death. He was then buried in an unmarked grave, but his body was then dug up by fascists before it's recovered again in August 1946, after the Second World War. There was a significant effect that Mussolini's execution had on the whole of the Second World War. When Adolf Hitler learned of his execution and public display of his former friend, on April 29, 1945, he then quickly acted to sort out his final affairs and his own death. On the same day he found out, he then recorded his last will and testament with Traudel Junger, his secretary, and then the following day he took his own life. Hitler stated how he did not want his body to fall into the hands of the enemy and to become a spectacle. It's clear that possibly the situation with Mussolini influenced Hitler's decision to take his own life and then have his body burned in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. But Mussolini's execution was rather hastily arranged, but what happened to his body afterwards was incredibly brutal, and it came at a time when the Second World War was lost in Europe for the Axis forces. Once again, thanks for watching. To support okay. our channel, so, please make sure to subscribe. And um, once again... So that gives us a nice little background that brings us to the end of World War II, which is really important. And also, I wanted to say, uh, who brought it up? Um, fun fact, after uh, Baldwin's ghost, after Italy lost World War II, the UN gave Italy back its colonies for a few years. This is literally what the Vietnam War was over. After Vietnam, after the end of World War II, after France in itself had been occupied by Nazis, it was like, can we please have our colonies back? Uh, is it okay? Can we just recolonize Indochina? Pretty please. How else I know are we supposed to make money to rebuild yeah, our we, our country? How can we have empire without our colony? And the United States is like, sure, France, you can you can have you can have a little colony as a treat. Um, and this is essentially what um, led up to the the Vietnamese the Vietnam War. So, are you familiar? That was a side tangent, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, are you familiar with this channel called the Cold War? 
Uh, I feel like I've seen it, but it's just like I'm always very wary of. I do not like this channel. I do okay. not like it at all. I've never included it in any of these videos. I not only do I dislike the information, I feel like it has a Western bias heavily. Oh, but definitely. also, I hate the dude. The guy who does it, <laughs> the way he moves his head, I feel like it's very, very, it's just very annoying. But there is an absolutely. M a very, very interesting claim that he makes in the first five minutes of this video. So can you just bring this up real quick? Because I've never heard this before. I tried to corroborate it more. And it's actually like incredibly damning of the United States. And j just play it real quick because first five minutes is all we need. First five. The Kingdom of Italy at the end of World War II was in a- This dude looks like a pretentious fucking asshole. Yeah. Just keep it paused real quick. Kensai, Ho Chi Minh visited the White House in 1945 asking for U.S. support to free Vietnam. He saw us supporting the French and thought we'd help the colony against their European conqueror. Ho Chi Minh actually also went to like the Versailles. Uh... Wait, what? Is... Is everything all right in chat? I didn't see anything pop up. That's why I'm like, what, what happened? Let me yeah. check real quick. Uh, but but so um, Ho Chi Minh actually went to the Versailles, like the Versailles, um, uh, whatever, where the Treaty of Versailles was being hashed out after World War One, and he wasn't even allowed in the building. Oh, it was a joke. Okay, <laughs> um, and uh, it wasn't. He wasn't even allowed in the building. Like they didn't even like because because at this point this is where they were doing like League of Nations stuff, and they were they like oh I think uh, they were like oh we want to put you know, give all men their, um, you know, all self-determination and all this. So Korean delegates and Ho Chi Minh showed up to be like, Hey, we would also like some self-determination. They're like, you're not allowed inside. How about that? <laughs> so, yeah, but let's, let's play this real quick. Cause there's an absolutely absurd claim that's made in this, or maybe it's true. I don't know, but play it real quick. Unique situation compared to other members of the Axis having only been occupied by Western allies with the exception of Yugoslavian partisan forces in the Northeast. The territory may not have been split, but the hearts and minds of Italians were. In a post-fascist era, would the country remain a monarchy or adopt a republican constitution? Would Italians veer towards communism or ally with the West? All real quick, Most of all, had already veered towards communism. Right, like, like that, that like, we're, 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 we're past like that, we're, we're past that. that. Kind of like wobbly precipice of a decision that is incorrect. That is an incorrect assessment of the situation. Like, they have already you... made a pretty popular, uh, popularly recognized choice towards socialism. So like, play that. Who were the people that were fighting the hardest against the Nazis? We're going to get into that, please. We have so much to go over Republic, here, and I'm excited to Italy do. bordered on the Iron Curtain and had an enviable geostrategic location. Exactly. The opposing exactly. blocs would certainly compete to extend their influence over the peninsula. I'm your host, David, and today we are going to enjoy some grappa, share some polenta, and talk about the roller coaster that is post war Italy. He moves this his is head so pretentiously when he talks. It really, it really upsets me. I don't know why. It's like you took some public speaking courses and they're like, you have to, to better really understand Italy's internal divisions. We must take a couple of steps back to the 25th of July, 1943. This is when the Grand Council of Fascism voted to oust Mussolini from his duties as Prime Minister. The King, Victor Emmanuel III, assumed command of the armed forces, had Il Duce arrested, and appointed a new Prime it? Minister, Field Marshal Badoglio. On the 8th of September, Badoglio announced that an armistice had been signed with the Allies, leaving the armed forces with an ambiguous set of instructions about whom to fight against if they were going to fight at all. The king and Badoglio fled to southern Italy, occupied by the Allies. From then until the end of the war, Italy was split in two. A kingdom of the south, now on the Allied side, and a new fascist state in the north, the Italian Social Republic, headed by Mussolini. This republic, still allied to Germany, was also fighting a civil war against a largely composite resistance force, including communists, socialists, monarchists, and Catholic-inspired parties. By April of 1945, it was clear that the war was lost for the Italian Social Republic. Both the United States and the USSR started making moves to extend their influence and shape a post-war Italy. One example of this concerns the fate Listen of Mussolini this. himself. On the 25th of April 1945, with the Allies and partisans advancing on Milan, Mussolini left the city with a motorcade of aides, officers, and German soldiers. 
journalist Vani Teodorani was a high-ranking aide to Il Duce at the time. Having been cut off from the motorcade, he was approached by two Italian agents serving with the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which I'm sure many of you know was the precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency. These OSS men tasked him with getting hold of Mussolini before he was arrested or shot by the partisans. In his memoirs, Teodorani mentions that this plan was coordinated by the US Army's Counterintelligence Corps. The next step would have been to fly Mussolini to Sardinia, then to an undisclosed location and recruit the former leader as an anti-communist asset. The plan failed, as you well know, and Mussolini's column was intercepted by communist fighters and he was put under arrest. According to several legislative and judiciary acts issued by the Kingdom of the South, the Allies and the Resistance, Mussolini was to be transported to Rome and put on trial. Nevertheless, he was executed on the 28th of April, an execution which again, according to Teodorani's diary entries, may have been ordered from the Soviet diplomatic legation in okay. Rome. So you can the pause this now? So what this man is telling me is that one of uh, Mussolini's top aides was approached by OSS officers so that they could apprehend Mussolini prior to his arrest and or execution so that he could be transported from Italy and then used as an anti-communist asset? Yeah, no, they probably would have tried to rehabilitate him. It wouldn't be the first time. I mean, like, look at fucking Franco in Spain. Franco died, like, in his 70s or his 80s, like, you right. know, peacefully. Well, same thing with Pinochet. Same thing yeah. with Pinochet. Yeah. Um, same thing with Rios Mont also. Right, but um, I mean, like, you know, uh, sure, you can make the, like, uh, where was Pinochet during World War II? I have no fucking idea. He well, I mean, like, I mean, he was probably Il Duce young. probably would have been a little bit more of... Well, let's go... Like a PR campaign would have been involved, you know? Go, probably. Back <laughs> go back to my slides for me. Am I closing this? Is this, are we done with this video? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So now go to this, Vanni Teodorani. This is the guy, uh, you have to switch this to English. Oh, it's in shit. Italian right now, right? Uh, ba, 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 ba. How the fuck Mind do I do that again? I give you the option to auto-translate it. Oh, son of a bitch. Uh, Entra contributi discioni. I fucking don't know where the fuck I would go to get this translated to English. Can anyone tell us boomers how to translate a Wikipedia page? Son of a bitch. Um, Hang on a like second. For me, for me, it comes up like immediately. Distract like, the people like, for a second. Just fucking... Hey, everybody. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, now, this is a really interesting thing. And, I, and like, obviously, as someone who's trying to impugn the CIA and the American State Department as, as vehemently as I possibly can, this was something that raised my eyebrows um, significantly, where I was like, wait, the, C the, the precursor of the CIA was trying to get Mussolini to employ him as an anti-communist agent? Um, and I tried finding more details of this, and I really wanted to find... Did you get it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um... I really wanted to find more information of this, but um, so go forward a little bit. Can you can you zoom in? Oh yeah, shit. Sorry. So go down. Um, in his diary published posthumously in 2014 by his children, Teodorani supports the hypothesis later formulated also by Luciano Garibaldi, according to which Mussolini was not killed by Walter Adosio and Aldo Lampredi, but by another commander who followed orders by English commands. According to Teodorani, it was the latter, not the CLN, who's the Liberation Resistance Force, who ordered the shooting of El Duce. So the Wikipedia page, isn't that saying like the opposite of what that guy said in that video? He's saying that it was English people who ordered to kill him, not Does that they mean, were trying to... Uh, this is so also auto-translated, so I think it might just mean like it, people speaking go English. Down. Go down, go down, go down. So look at this first note. Uh, Mussolini killed by order of Churchill. Okay, never mind. So like... I'm so confused at this point as to like, not that it really matters for our whole discussion here, but for that guy to say that he was being absconded by the OSS for anti-communist um, purposes to utilize him for. And then the moment it's, it, he cites this individual's diary or his memoirs. And then when I immediately, when I go to the Wikipedia page, it pretty much has the exact opposite. I'm just like perplexed and I couldn't find any other source to say that. So um, that's a very big YouTube channel about Cold War history. And I, I, so this is up in the air. I don't know. 
So um, you can go for now. I just wanted to show this to everybody because that was just right. so interesting to me. Oh, and, and this guy was also, of course, because he was so close to, uh, you know, fucking Mussolini was a yeah. piece of shit. I don't know if you can tell that he wrote uh, an article that said, like, the U.S. elephant and the flea Jewish in the Middle East, yeah. Ilka cha-cha-cha. Yeah, definitely, like, a big piece of shit. He was yeah. a big aide to Mussolini. For yeah, sure. so... So I don't know. I, I wish I could have given you something more, um, more precise than that. But like, I'm even in myself. So now here's something else. Bring up this video. Uh, pause it. So this is a video about Gladio, but the <sighs> intro is very, very relevant to what we're going to talk about. And again, I will remind you, we're talking about Italy from 1947 to 1948, or maybe it's 46 to 48, but for those of you that know, Gladio did not happen at that time. So we're not going to jump ahead to the Gladio stuff. There's a whole section of this book that pertains to audio of Gladio. This will not be the only time that we visit Italy in the reading of Killing Hope. So this is also a YouTube channel that I just found out. I believe he's an Italian Marxist that makes videos about Italy. Bess D. Marx. I've, I'm a, familiar with this, with this Twitter. <laughs> oh, is he cool? He seems all right. I think he might be like okay. a little bit of a Maoist, but like, you know. I'm all right with that. Yeah. So let's play this. Just the first four minutes is all we need because it really kind of gives us a very well put together and Marxist perspective of what Italy is dealing with after the war. After World War II, the specter of communism haunted Italy's ruling class. The Partigiani, or the Partisans, which had defeated the fascists and killed Mussolini, were mostly communists. The popularity of communism was exploding. During the end of the war, the Communist Party of Italy had more than doubled in size. They would gather about 150,000 armed people. And in 1944, over 500,000 workers in Torino, waving the red flag, shut down the factories for over a week despite brutal Gestapo repression. The Communist Party became the second largest party of Italy already after World War II, attracting over 2 million members by 1947. It became the largest communist party in the West. Post-war Italy was close to become the first communist country in Western Europe. The Italian bourgeoisie in the US, which was now by far the dominant capitalist power in the world, had to come up with something quickly. The history of Italy during the Cold War is one of the most fascinating periods because it shows how fascism was never really defeated. It just went underground, waiting to re-emerge and P2. once again save the wealthy from the red tsunami of the E2 Italia. In what sounds like fiction created by the Assassin's Creed 2 producers, the ruling class established a secret network involving Freemasonry, the Mafia, the Vatican, the business and political establishment, and the CIA to fight and crush Italy's communists. The Italian parliamentary... It, it's so hard to talk about this shit to like somebody that knows nothing about it and not look like an unhinged fucking like crazy person right and also for me before i read killing hope like if you're just kind of getting into like the this like communist history sphere and you know you start learning about cuba and then you hear about like china and you're like oh man i'm learning about Soviet. when you pick up this book you're like wait where it's it, it's italy too like you know what i mean yeah. like it's like yeah. you start running down the list yeah. of all the places where like there was like a very popular and dynamic socialist movement that is repressed you start realizing like you're like oh so it's just everywhere in the world yes it's like, no uh, really yeah, all it, everywhere that there's america, people it's like all of south and central america all of asia um all of africa most of the middle east and even like most of europe i guess yeah. like <laughs> it's like uh, literally like the africa central world. america south america uh yeah. asia like literally anywhere in asia anywhere in the it, middle east uh you want everywhere wanna, in africa everywhere in africa australia you bet your ass. Yeah. <laughs> so, go ahead here. Mission ...published a report in 1992 concluding that members of the so-called Gladio were armed bands supported by the CIA through funding and weaponry to weaken the Italian left. 
This is the second video on the Italian fascist movement, which is part of a series I'm making in light of the likely win of Meloni in the coming general election on September 25th on Sunday, who is about to form the most right-wing government of Italy since Mussolini. Meloni's party, Fratelli d'Italia, has never clearly broken from its fascist past. And this past, which we are going to talk about now, is one of the bloodiest, most chaotic and most mysterious periods in the modern history of Italy. All right, we can stop this there. So Did this is like a whole so? 30 minute video. Check it out if you want After to the like, watch the whole thing. Um, but like this is more like focused on Gladio and more things that happened in like the 60s, which we will be getting into at a later chapter of this book. But right now we are specifically dealing with the few years following World War II. Now, something I want to talk about here, uh, bring up this massacre that happened, the Portella della oh, Dinestra. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Portobello della Dinestra, uh, Port oh. Port so Portella della Dinestra Mass. Just so that we can figure out exactly like the climate here of... Um, and it's so funny. We haven't even gotten into the William Blum portion of this yet. Yeah. We're, we're just kind of like going over like some extracurriculars. So the Portella della Ginestra massacre was one of the most violent acts in the history of modern Italian politics. When 11 people were killed, 27 wounded during a May Day celebration in Sicily on May 1st, 1947 in the municipality of Piana degli Albanesi. Those held responsible were the bandit and separatist leader Salvatore Giuliano and his gang. Although their motives and intentions are still a matter of controversy. And that's what we're going to get into. So go down a little bit. So for May 19th, okay, we can go down a little bit. I don't think we need to get into that entirely. Let's go to the massacre. On May 1st, 1947, hundreds of mostly poor peasants gathered at Portella della Ginestra, three kilometers from the town of Piana degli Albanese. Jesus, these Italian names are so many syllables. <laughs> On the way to San Giuseppe Giotto for the traditional International Labor Day Parade. At 10.15, the Communist Party secretary, Piani degli Albanese, began to address the crowd when gunfire broke out. It was later determined that the machine guns had been fired from the surrounding hills, as well as by men on horseback. 11 people were killed, including four children. These are their names. 27 people were wounded, including a little girl who had her jaw shot off. The attack was attributed to the bandit and separatist leader, Salvatore Giuliano. His aim had been to push local leftists, punish local leftists for the recent election results. In an open letter, he took sole responsibility for the murders and claimed that he had only wanted his men to fire above the heads of the crowd. The deaths had been a mistake. So go down. No, it was a mistake. So in, 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 until the massacre, he was regarded many as a modern-day Robin Hood who stole from and even kidnapped wealthy Sicilians to help the impoverished Sicilians. The shooting of the children and peasants in Genestra, however, outraged his former admirers. And then there was a bounty. Go down. Okay. So the massacre created a national scandal. The communist-controlled Italian General Confederation of Labor called a general strike in protest against the massacre. According to newspaper reports, hints at the possibility of civil war were heard as communist leaders harangued meetings of six million workers who struck throughout Italy in protest against the May Day massacre in Sicily. The Minister of the Interior, the Christian Democrat Mario Selba, reported that the parliament the next day that so far as the police could determine, the Portella Gela Dinestra shooting was non-political. So specifically a May Day um, consolidation of communists this was non-political, according to the Christian Democrat leader. Huh. Keep the Christian Democrats in mind because they are extremely important in everything we're about to discuss. And that's why I want us to read over this real quick so we understand the unscrupulous individuals that we're dealing with. Bandits notoriously infested the mountains in which it occurred, said Scalba. Lucasi disagreed. Lucasi is a communist and charged that the mafia had perpetuated the attack in cahoots with the large landowners, monarchists, and the rightist common man's front. The debate ended in a fist fight between the left and right, and nearly 200 deputies took part in the brawl. That's awesome. So scroll past the victim section, please. Um, go up. Um, denouncing the massacre. Okay, I think this is... Yes. Lucasi and Scalba would be the main opponents in the aftermath of the massacre and the successive killing of the suspected perpetrator, Guliano. And the trial against Guliano's lieutenant, Gaspare Pisciotta, and others remaining members of Giuliano's gang, while Selba dismissed any political motive, Lee Cossi stressed the political nature of the massacre and tried to uncover the truth. Lee Cossi claimed that the police inspector, Ettore Messena, supposed to coordinate the persecution of the bandits, had been in league with Giuliano and denounced Selba for allowing Messina to remain in office. Later documents would prove this accusation. So now there's documented proof 
of this collusion between the police and the Christian Democrats. Um, Likosi suspected a campaign against the left and linked it with a crisis in the national government under Prime Minister Alcide Gaspari. Keep that name in mind, too. Um, which would lead to the expulsion of the communists and the socialists from the government, as well as to prevent the left from entering the regional government. On May 30th, 1947, Giuseppe Alessi became the first president of the Sicilian region with support of the center-right. In the same day, Giuseppe announced his new centrist government, who had been the national union governments since 1945. Okay, go down a little bit. Let me see exactly where we are. Okay, so this is where it starts getting weird. Speaking at Portella di Ginestra on the second anniversary of the massacre, Lucasi publicly called Giuliano to name names. He received a written reply from the bandit leader. It is only men with no shame who give out names, not a man who tends to take justice into his own hands, who aims to keep his reputation in society high and who values his aim more than his own life. Lucosi, go down. Um, Lucosi responded by reminding Giuliano that he would be almost certainly be betrayed. Don't you understand that Selba will have you killed? Again, Lucosi is, Lucosi is the communist. Sabella is the Christian Democrat guy. Um, Giuliano replied, hinting at the powerful secrets that he possessed. I know that Selba wants to have me killed. He wants to have me killed because I keep a nightmare hanging over him. I can make sure he is brought to account for his actions that, if revealed, would destroy his political career and end his life. So here we have the individual who perpetuated this massacre, heavily implying that the Christian Democrat leader, he has quite a bit of dirt on him regarding this incident. So then he was killed, the, the man who uh, perpetuated it. When the hearings for the trial against Giuliano's captured associates started in Viterbo near Rome, he always denied that there had been anyone behind him who had ordered the killing. However, his lieutenant and other witnesses claimed that a few days before the massacre, Giuliano had received a letter, which he destroyed immediately after reading it. He told his gangs, boys, the hour of our liberation is at hand. According to witnesses, the letter demanded the massacre in exchange for liberty for the gang. So... Further evidence that this was in collusion with the government. Go down. Um, let me see if I can. Um... Okay. So um, the trial against the perpetrators of the massacre started in the summer of 1950. Selba, the Christian Democrat, was again said to have been involved in the plot to carry out the massacre. But the accusations were often contradictory or vague. In the end, the judge concluded that no higher authority ordered the massacre and that Giuliano Band had acted autonomously. But at the trial, he, Prisciotta, which was like a lieutenant of this gang that killed these people, said again and again that Selba had gone back on his word. They returned to plode pleading for total amnesty for us, but Selba denied all his promises. So now even someone that was involved said that the Christian Democrat leader had promised them amnesty. And then also, um, okay, and then go down. There's just one more section here. Pisciotta was sentenced to life imprisonment yeah. and forced labor. Yeah, you can go ahead and read this one if you want. Them. Most of the other 70 bandits met the same fate. Others were at large, but one by one, they all disappeared. Pisciotta probably was the only one who could reveal the truth behind the massacre. <coughs> While he was in Giuliano's band. He carried a pass signed by a colonel of uh, the Carabinieri that allowed him to move freely about the island. At the trial, he declared, we are one body, bandits, police, and mafia, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Further putting through the collusion, and just like in that, that base D Marx video where they said that there's this collusion between the bandits slash the mafia and yeah. then the government and like the CIA and shit. Go so, ahead. while serving his sentence, he wrote his autobiography, awaiting a new trial at which he would be charged with killing Giuliano. Some authorities were beginning to take his evidence more seriously, and perjury and other charges were made against police and carabinieri. Pisciotta realized that he had been abandoned and was threatening to reveal much more than at the first trial. In particular, who signed the letter which had been brought to Giuliano just before the attack? On 9th of February 1954, he took a cup of coffee with what he thought was a tuberculosis medicine. Instead, someone had replaced it with strychnine. Within an hour, he was dead and his autobiography disappeared. The massacre created a national scandal, which ended in 1956 with the conviction of the remaining members of Giuliano's gang. It still remains a highly controversial topic. The finger of blame has been pointed at numerous sources, including the Italian government. Leftists who were the victims of the attack have blamed the landed barons and the mafia. 
Significantly, the memorial plaque erected by them makes no mention of Giuliano or his band. On May 1, 1947, while celebrating the Working Class Festival and the victory of April 20th, men, women, and children of Piano, South uh, Ciparello, and South Giuseppe fell under the bullets of the mafia and the landed barons who crushed the struggle of the peasants against feudalism. Porta del Genestra uh, Massacre Memorial Plaque. So just down here real quick for the theory. While some historians see the massacre as a conspiracy of the mafia, anti-communist political forces, the Christian Democratic Party in particular, and American intelligence services in the wake of the Cold War, um, others, you know, that, that's just kind of what I'm saying here, is that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this was carried out by the Christian Democrats. So let's go back to the slides now. I mean, like, it's just a safe bet that, like, if they're Christian Democrat, they're awful. They're, okay, so they're... That's, everything, that's everything for there. Right. So now we get into the good William Bloom uh, stuff here. So those who do not believe in the ideology of the United States shall not be allowed to stay in the... Oh, Hashkush, five gifted th subs. Thank you so, 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 Thank so, so much. Thank you very kindly. Um, you are just the angel coming in to bless us with your blessings. Thank you so, 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 so much. And thank you for being here. Um, those who do not believe in the ideology of the United States shall not be allowed to stay in the United States, declared the American Attorney General Tom Clark in January of 1948. In March, okay, here's another thing where I hate the writing of this author. In March, <laughs> the Justice Department over which Clark presided determined that Italians who did not believe in the ideology of the United States would not be allowed to emigrate to or even enter the United States. That was what but one tag did in a remarkable American campaign to ensure that Italians who did not believe in the ideology of the United States would not be allowed to form a government of a differing ideology in Italy in their election of 1948. It's like the same sentence like twice. You could have literally reduced that down to like a single sentence. I think we would have gotten the, the point across. I don't know if he's exactly. like trying to max out the word count or something. Is he getting paid per word or paragraph? I don't know, but... Yeah. Whatever. So two years earlier, the Italian Communist Party, one of the largest in the world, and the Socialist Party had together garnered more votes and s more seats in the Constituent Assembly election than the Christian Democrats. But the two parties of the left had run separate candidates and thus had to be content with some ministerial posts um, in a coalition cabinet under the Christian Democrat premier. The results, nonetheless, spoke plainly enough to the fear to put Marx to put the fear of Marx into the Truman administration. Can you open that general election one? I'm going to grab some water. Yeah, 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 yeah. How you doing, Anxious Mika? Yes, the enemy is imperialism. Look at these guys. These all look like uh, neat guys. Well, not him, but these, these two look all right, you know? This guy especially. You know, he seems pretty cool. Okay. So, um, what we want to go over here is go down. Okay. So, this is the general election, um, which, as William Blum stated... Um, is the um, where the socialists and the communists want a significant majority, so go down. Up in the north. Yeah, so go down. So go down. Down. Okay, here's the results here. So if you look here, this is when the Socialist Party of Proletarian Unity and the Italian Communist Party, they ran separately. But if you look at the Christian democracy here, um, they got 8 million, 1, 8.1 million. But if you actually put together the Socialist and the Communist Party, um, you have over 9 million, almost 10 million, um, seats well, that's there. Weird, so, because it looks like they have oh, a minority compared to the Christian Democrats. Oh, no, wait, I'm, I'm lumping in all these other dark blue ones. Sorry, I hate charts like this. Yeah. Um, so if you look over at the seats, it says it pretty succinctly. Because, um, I guess in right. the political system of, uh, Italy, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like the United States kind of thing. It's like, you know. A you certain amount of plurality each party you know yeah. what i mean so it's like even though the christian democracy democrats got the largest amount of single votes for their party we're looking at over we're looking at more seats for the communists and socialists than for the christian democrats so, huh, now, so it kind of seems like the socialists and democrats want i mean not the democrats the socialists and communists want so go back to the slides yeah because i want to look at the municipal elections real quick also so go down so now okay so these the <clears throat> these municipal elections take part over a period of time so here first in march 10th this is only 434 municipalities <clears throat> the socialists and communists fell short here go down now in march 17th 
you see the concentration of the left, which is the socialists and the communists together, is over the Christian Democrats with more municipalities go down. And then now we're seeing that 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 divide grow a little bit more. Oh well now the Christian Democrats are are in front on this one. Hmm. Go down. Also, what's up with these guys? Oh I'm these not like sure. Dem socks, yeah, social democrats. All right, go down again. So now we're down to April and we're seeing again a majority of the concentration on the left. Go down again. Okay. That's it. And that so you know, we can see like the 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 voting trends of the individuals here. I did five municipalities, there is no prevalence of any party, which I assume okay. is either the fascists or the anarchists. Yeah. All right, so let's move oh. forward. Pressing, pressing domestic needs in Italy, such as agricultural and economic reform, the absence of which produced abysmal extremes of wealth and poverty, were not the to be the issues of the one day. The lines of battle would be drawn around the question of democracy versus communism, the idea of capitalism remaining discreetly to one side, the fact that communists had been the single most active anti-fascist group in Italy during the war, undergoing ruthless persecution while the Christian Democrat government of 1948 and other electoral opponents on the right were riddled through with collaborators, monarchists, and plain unreconstructed fascists. This too would be ignored, indeed turned around. It was now a matter of communist dictatorship versus their adversaries' love of freedom. This was presumed a priori. As one example, a group of American congressmen visited Italy in summer 1947 and casually and arbitrarily concluded that the country is under great pressure from within and without to veer to the left and adopt a totalitarian collective national organization. So this is the dichotomy that needs to be established by the United States that while there is a um, organic development towards communism for a very legitimate reason and we've gone over that with the partisans being the most principled largest and took the most losses in their resistance against fascism um, and then we can see that play out in voting trends as well now the united states needs to make this not like versus like this organic um grassroots communist movement but like this needs to be like a soviet agent inspired um you know a subvers uh, insidious totalitarian red dawn <laughs> exactly soviets are invading so pro okay so while some more prominent fascists were publicly disgraced or even killed many former party members or sympathizers re-entered the political establishment among these was one of italy's most important post-war prime ministers Amintor fanfani leader of the moderate christian democratic party for most of parts of the 1950s 60s and 80s he had been a member of the fascist party and a signatory of the anti-Semitic racial laws introduced in 1938. You don't have to click the link. That's just where I took this from. Okay. I was just looking for some evidence of fascists that were kind of like in West Germany, where they kind of like rehabilitated the Nazis and put them back into the political structure. This is an example of that happening in Italy. Um, almost like Hans Globke, who was an individual who was like part of like the arc was one of the principal architects of like the Jewish laws in Germany. Yeah. Here we have another individual who's in the fascist party and also was a signatory on the anti-Semitic race laws, who then became um, a leader of the modern Christian Democratic Party for parts of the 50s, 60s and 80s. To make, uh, to make any of this at all credible, the whole picture had to be pushed and squeezed into the frame of the American way of life versus the Soviet way of life. A specious proposition, which must have come as somewhat of a shock to the leftists who regarded themselves as Italian and neither Russian nor American. In February 1948, after non-communist ministers in Czechoslovakia, a in chat, where are you at? Had boycotted cabinet meetings over a dispute concerning police hiring practices, the communist government dissolved the coalition cabinet and took sole power. The Voice of America pointed to this event repeatedly as a warning to the Italian people of the fate of 27 awaiting them if Italy went communist and used as well by anti-communists for decades afterwards as a prime example of communist duplicity 
Yet, all by all appearances, the Italian Christian Democrat government and the American government had conspired the previous year in an even more blatant usurpation of power. So they bring up this situation of the Czechoslovakian cabinet being uh, dismissed here and how the United States raised this as like, look, look at this totalitarian system. Look how evil the communists are. But then they proceed to do this. Move forward in the slide. In January 1947, when Italian premier Alcide de Gaspari visited Washington at the United States invitation, his overriding concern was to plead for crucial financial assistance in his for his war-torn, impoverished country. American officials may have had a different priority. Three days after returning to Italy, Digaspari unexpectedly dissolved his cabinet, sounds familiar, um, which included several communists and socialists. The press reported that many people in Italy believed that Gaspari's action was related to his visit to the United States and was aimed at decreasing leftist, principally communist, mm -hmm. influence on the government. After two weeks of torturous delay, the formation of a new center or center-right government sought by Gaspari proved infeasible. The new cabinet still included communists and socialists, although the left had lost key positions, noticeably the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Finance. So go forward, there's another piece to this. From this point until May, when De Gaspari's deputy, Ivan Lombardo, led a mission to Washington to renew the request for aid, promised loans were frozen by the United States for reasons not very clear. On several occasions during this period, the Italian left asserted their belief that the aid was being held up pending the ouster of leftists from the cabinet. The New York Times was moved to note that some observers here feel that a further leftward swing in Italy would retard aid. As matters turned out, the day b <laughs> as matters turned out, the day b Lombardo arrived in Washington, De Gaspari again dissolved his entire cabinet and suggested that the new cabinet would manage without the benefit of leftist members. This was indeed what occurred, and over the ensuing few months, exceedingly generous American financial aid flowed into Italy, in addition to the cancellation of the nation's $1 billion debt to the United States. See, so that's all it takes for you to, you know, get out from your loan to the U.S. Yeah. So here we see that the very hypocritically, the thing that it was criticizing the Soviet Union for in terms of like, you know, being so authoritarian in how it treats its political structure is happening right there at the behest of the American government. And I don't know if this information didn't come out until after William Bloom wrote this book, but click that link, that link for me, please. You got it. Because shit. like, I feel like it's so much shit, more shit. explicit right here than the way that he described it. So. In the May 1947 crisis, the communists were excluded from government in Italy and France. The crisis contributed to the start of the Cold War in Western Europe. Can you read this paragraph for me? That's 1984 and that's in 2013, so it's definitely aware. In Italy, the Christian Democratic, led by Alcide de Gaspari, were losing popularity and feared that the leftist coalition would take power. The Italian Communist Party, PCI, was growing particularly fast due to its organizing efforts supporting sharecroppers in Sicily, Tuscany, and Umbria, movements which were also bolstered by the reforms of Fausto Gullo, the Communist Minister of Agriculture. On the 1st of May, the nation was thrown into crisis by the murder of 11 leftist peasants, including four children, at an International Workers' Day parade in Palermo by Salvatore Giuliano and his gang. In the political chaos which ensued, the president engineered the expulsion of all left-wing ministers from the cabinet on 31st of May. Ministers belonging to the Italian Socialist Party, PSI, which was closely allied with the communists, we were, all, were also removed from the cabinet. The PSI would have a national position in government again for 20 years. Oh, would not have a national position in government again for 20 years. De Gaspari did this under pressure from the U.S. Secretary of State, George Marshall, who had informed him that anti-communism was a precondition for receiving American aid. The amb And Ambassador James C. Dunn, who had directly asked De Gaspari to dissolve the parliament and remove the PCI. Yeah, so this says it in no, no ambiguous terms, yeah. like that the, there was american ambassadors who directly are like get rid of them right um 
And, and then this is also interesting here, just the second part of it. Uh, the Italian political crisis and anti-communist movement were dependent on mafia violence. The mafia made deep connections with Christian Democrats in the mid-1940s through figures such as Calagero Vizzini, who was an operative for the U.S. military. The politicized mafia employed terror as a tact against the labor movement and the Communist Party, killing dozens of leftists in this period. The May 1st massacre by Salvatore Giuliano is often alleged to be one of these Christian Democrat-associated events. According to Peter Robb, the mafia had commissioned the crime for the politicians, just as it was picking off individual communists, socialists, and trade unionists. Another dozen had been killed the same year of 1947. The mafia was making itself useful to its new political protectors by dispatching its enemies, a pattern that was to continue for decades. Prior to his mysterious killing in state custody, Giuliano Lieutenant Gaspare Pisciotta implicated the, the, the Christian Democrats directly for the massacre through Ministry of Interior Mario Selba. Writers such as uh, Gaia Servadio yeah. and Peter Dale Scott believe that there was U.S. involvement through an intelligence mafia network run by William J. Donovan. While specific accusations are controversial, there is a consensus that Guliano was being used as a vanguard in domestic political battle with the communists. So, again, just further going into that point that I was making there. Also, the... Um, the what the fuck is it? This is literally from like you know uh, this footnote is from 2015, and this is from 2003, the history of yeah. contemporary Italy society of politics. So, you know, it's not as if like this information wasn't around. But you know? doesn't it seem like William Bloom didn't say it as as unambiguously as that? It seems like Wikipedia is like, yo, the American ambassador went to them to gave us D Gaspari and was like, get him out. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it does kind of seem like why 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 are you writing it like this this yeah. this you could be way more overt about this it wouldn't be that controversial so now we get into some of the bullet points of how like the cia and the state department brought more broadly the state department was involved in the italian election situation so uh go ahead johnny you can read this one a massive letter writing campaign from americans of italian extraction to the relatives and friends in italy at first written by individuals in their own words or guided by sample letters and newspapers soon expanded to mass-produced pre-written postage paid form letters cablegrams educational circulars and posters needing only an address and signature and from a group of a group calling itself the committee to aid democracy in italy half a million picture postcards illustrating the gruesome fate awaiting italy if it voted for dictatorship or foreign dictatorship in all, an estimated 10 million pieces of mail were written and distributed by newspapers, radio stations, churches, the American Legion, wealthy individuals, etc., etc., and business advertisements now included offers to send letters, airmail to Italy, even if you didn't buy the product. All this with the publicly expressed approval of the acting secretary of state and post office, which inaugurated special freedom flights to give greater publicity to the dispatch of the mail to Italy. So, like, you know, what started is just urging people to, like, write letters that were, like, anti-communist in nature, urging, like, the Italian relatives to not vote for communists. This kind of became a thing where there was just pre-written, pre-paid, like, you know, just postcards that you just have to put a name and address to and we'll send them out, like, you know, like a, a strongly urged and, like, very kind of coerced um letter writing campaign well it's not even really letter writing it's more like letter signing it's really at just, this point. just give us your um, name <laughs> just get... yeah um so yeah so there's a little more info on this on the next one the form letters contain messages such as a communist victory would ruin italy the united states would withdraw aid and a world war would probably result probably uh, <laughs> we implore you not to throw our beautiful italy into the arms of that cruel despot co communism America hasn't anything against communism in Russia, but why impose it on other people, other <laughs> lands, in that way putting out the torch of liberty? If the forces of true democracy should lose in the Italian elections, the American government will not send any more money to Italy, and we won't send any more money to you either, our relatives. So, um, uh, aid what? is like a huge thing in this in this equation where they're just constantly danging. This is during the time of the Marshall Plan. For those right. of you that know, in the war-torn western europe and other countries um that so severely needed economic aid after their battle with the nazis america was in a prime position that to dangle aid over them in exchange for influence over their government yeah and i think it should not be discounted that literally italy had a massive civil war right 
Uh, yeah. Think of like, you know, how we always talk about how like the Soviet Union, when it was first getting up off the ground, we had to like rebuild all of this infrastructure. You got to remember that like they're dealing with not even just like, you know, the, the, the physical wounds of infrastructural damage due to that civil war, but also the psychological and spiritual wounds between communities just being ripped apart. But, right. uh, you know, from 1947 to 1948, Voice of America daily broadcasts into Italy were sharply increased, highlighting news of American assistance or gestures of friendship to Italy. A sky full of showbiz stars, including Frank Sinatra and Gary Cooper, recorded a series of radio pro programs designed to win friends and influence the vote in Italy. Five broadcasts of Italian-American housewives were aired, and Italian-Americans with some leftist credentials were also in listed for the cause labor lady labor leader luigi antonini called upon italians to smash the muscovite fifth column which follows the orders of the ferocious moscow tyranny or else italy would become an enemy totalitarian country or totalitarian so, uh, country oh, whatever okay, i always it. pronounce that weird to counter communist charges in italy that negroes in the united states were denied opportunities the voa broadcast the story of a negro couple who had made a fortune in the junk business and built a hospital for their people in oklahoma city it should be remembered that in 1948 american negroes had not yet reached the status of second class citizens Oh yeah, which uh, we have you know. covered extensively. <laughs> right, exactly. You know what I mean. So it's like we um, just want you to know that my soul hurts Italian <laughs> <now>. <laughs> and Frankster also. Imagine being a communist in Italy and relative males you are. This bullshit. <laughs> 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 what are the what are the fuck is this? Why yeah. are you sending me a letter? <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, the Voice of America is essentially a CIA front. Uh, media company in the same vein of Radio for Europe and Radio Free Asia. Um, <laughs> Look what they did to my boy. <laughs> no, they, look how they massacred my boy. Look how they massacred my boy. Voice of America daily broadcasts in Italy were sharply increased. Oh, wait, we just read this. Oh, you read this one already? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. No, you're good. The Justice Department served notice that Italians who joined the Communist Party would be denied the dream of so many Italians immigration to America. America. The State Department then ruled that any Italians known to have voted for the communists would not be allowed to even enter the terrestrial paradise. A department telegram with New York Politico read, Voting communist appears to constitute affiliation with the Communist Party, with meaning of immigration law, and therefore would require exclusion from the United States. It was urged that this information be emphasized. Look, emphasized. Emphasized. Well, I mean, like, here's another thing. Theater. We're talking, like, 1947, 1948. You know, just a, just a quick 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 reminder italians weren't considered white yet yeah like they weren't allowed into the the glorious sanctuary of whiteness just yet like li literally like i when my grandma was still alive i remember asking her like wait so there was a time when italians were not considered white and she's like no <laughs> I, I still kind of don't <laughs> it's kind of like like uh what's it called what are those people called irish people also yeah, 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 I think they were always considered white, but they were considered like white dogs, like subhuman whites. No, like the, my my grandparents did. Were they're not a fan of Italians? Oh yeah, I forgot that your grandparents aren't Italian. Yeah, no, on my mom's side. No, yeah. well, it's a long conversation, but okay, never, right, don't worry about good, it. Good. More than two hundred American labor leaders of Italian origin at a conference, out of which came a cable <laughs> sent to twenty-three daily newspapers throughout See Italy. Guys from Jersey, <laughs> a collection of individuals from New Jersey got from together. That, more than two hundred American labor leaders of Italian origin held a conference, out of which came a cable. Sent to 23 daily newspapers throughout Italy, similarly urging thumbs down on the Reds. At the time of time, the Italian American Labor Council contributed $50,000 to the anti communist labor organizations in Italy. The CIA was already secretly subsidizing such trade unions to counteract the influence of the leftist unions, but this was a standard agency practice independent of electoral considerations. According to a former CIA officer, when, in 1945, the communists came very near to gaining control of labor unions, first in Sicily, then in all Italy and southern France, cooperation between the OSS and the Mafia successfully stemmed the tide. 
The CIA, by its own later admission, gave $1 million to the Italian center parties at King's Ransom in Italy in 1948. 11, oh, not to, fuck, I, I, it got me. I'm sorry. I, I got the that. footnote got me. Although another report replaces this figure at ten million dollars, the agency also forged documents and letters purported to come from the PCI, which were designed to put the party in a bad light and discredit its leaders. Anonymous books and magazines, articles funded by the CIA, told in vivid detail about supposed communist activities in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Pamphlets dealt with PCI candidates' sex and personal lives, as well as smearing them with fascist and or anti-church brush. Yeah. So, um, obviously, as we see here, just CIA is just funneling millions and millions of dollars to sabotage leftist labor unions. Um, let's go forward here. Especially for a country that, like, you know, what, what, is, what is their major export? Oh, like, go. fucking olive oil? So yeah, the, the source of all that is from this this thing called the Pike Report, which goes into um, some of the CIA dealings at this time. It was like leaked in the 70s, and then it was released here, the unexpurgated Pike Report. Do you see who the foreword is by? House Report, uh, the report of House Select Committee on Intelligence, 19... Oh, Philip Agee! That's yeah. the guy! That's the guy! That's, yeah, that's the in-the-company guy. That's the... He's a, uh, a reformed CIA agent. He's that, doing like, his well, best. He's still going to hell, but he's trying. Yeah, he, he fled to Cuba, which is a good thing for his credibility. <laughs> um, but in this, in this, it says, The in-depth analysis appears that the Select Committee's report of three major cohort action projects, each of great interest... Intervention in Italian elections since 1948 cost the CIA $75 million, including $10 million spent in 1972 alone. Obviously, we're jumping ahead a little bit here because this is not the last time that we'll be visiting Italy as we no. read this book. Most of this money went to the Christian Democrats, although Ambassador Graham Martin obtained over the CIA's objection a donation of $800,000 in 1972 for political forces of the Italian neo-fascist movement. Huh. Uh, I think that's what, where we're getting to Gladio a little bit. The ambassador insisted on the donation in order to demonstrate solidarity for the long pull. Underlining CIA's intervention in Italy was a revelation in the early 1976 from government sources other than the select committee that President Ford had approved in December 1975 in the Italian electoral process during the months preceding the next Italian elections. So, all right, that, that's all we needed there. So, President Ford, also a scumbag. Yes. The State Department backed up the warnings in the letters by announcing that if communists should win, there would be no further question of assistance from the United States. The Italian left felt complete, compelled to regularly assure voters that this would not really happen. This, in turn, inspired American officials, including Secretary of State George Marshall, to repeat the threat. Marshall was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1953. As a daily series of direct shortwave broadcasts to Italy, backed by the State Department and featuring prominent Americans, the State Department estimated that there were 1.2 million shortwave receivers in Italy as of 1946, the Attorney General went on the air and assured the Italian people that the election was a choice between democracy and communism, between God and godlessness, between order and chaos. William Donovan, the wartime head of the OSS, foreigner of the CIA, warned that under a communist dictatorship in Italy, many of the nation's industrial plants would be dismantled and shipped to Russia, and millions of Italy's workers would be deported to Russia for forced labor. If this were not enough to impress the Italian listeners, a parade Un of unknown but passionate refugees from Eastern Europe went before the microphone to recount the horror stories of life behind the Iron Curtain. Dun, dun, dun. Bum, yep. bum, bum. Okay. So, through, though some Italians may have been convinced at times that Stalin himself was the FDP's principal candidate, the actual Soviet intervention in the election hardly merited a single headline. The American press engaged in speculation that the Russians were pouring substantial sums of money into the Communist Party's coffers. However, a survey carried out by the Italian Bureau of the United Press revealed that the anti-communist party spent seven and a half times as much as the FDP on all forms of propaganda. The Christian Democrats alone spending four times as much. As for other Soviet actions, Howard K. Smith presented this observation. 
The Russians tried to respond with few feeble gestures for a while. Some Italian war prisoners were released, some newsprint was sent to Italy and offered to all parties for their campaign, but there was no way of resisting what amounted to a tidal wave. There is evidence that the Russians found the show getting too rough for them and actually became apprehensive of what the American and British reaction to a communist victory at the polls might be. Russia's concern about the conflict with the West was also expressed within a month of the Italian elections in one of the celebrated common form letters to Tito, accusing the Yugoslavs of trying to involve the Soviets in the Western powers when it should have been known that the USSR, after such a heavy war, could not start a new one. We've had this discussion, obviously. Yeah, the, like, you know, I mean, like, I was talking about it earlier in Marcus's stream about how, like, you know, after, you know, the U.S. dropped two atomic bombs on civilians in another country, you know, they're still a year away from even conducting their first nuclear experiment. They have no idea how many the U.S. has. They really can't risk a fucking hot war with the U.S., especially considering they're still trying to build back their own fucking country. I, and I and I'm, I agree with that, but also, you know what I mean? There's just some times where, like, when you're reading about his country, like Italy, for example, like yeah. you read this, and then, like, when it's a footnote you, that they could have helped more, you're like, oh, man, we could have done something here. But I, I understand that there's much broader geopolitical uh, right. um, implications here. Not to mention, I'm sure that, like, in the calculus, right, of them allotting, like, you know, where the budget is going to be, right, yeah. considering Stalin had a much friendlier, friendlier relationship with FDR compared to Truman, like this yeah. literally just put a fucking wrench in everything that like they thought they were going to be able to accomplish over the next couple of years. Right. So, and then we're at like about the end here. I just wanted to put this at the end because I found this on Wikipedia. It's just CIA activities in Italy. This is just a good cap to put on everything. If you want to read the first like two, I'll read the second two. Sure. The 1948 general election was greatly influenced by the Cold War and was starting between the United States and the Soviet Union. The CIA has acknowledged giving $1 million to Italian centrist parties. The CIA has also accused of, has all, has been, uh, has also been accused of publishing forged letters in order to discredit the leaders of the Italian Communist Party. The National Security Act of 1947, which made foreign covert operations possible, had been signed into law about six months earlier by the American president, Harry S. Truman. We had bags of money that we delivered to selected politicians to defray their politicians' political expenses, their campaign expenses for posters, for pamphlets, according to CIA operative F. Mark Wyatt. In order to influence the election, the U.S. agencies undertook a campaign of writing 10 million letters, made numerous shortwave radio broadcasts, and funded the publishing of books and articles, all of which warned the Italians of what was believed to be the consequences of a communist victory. Time magazine backed this campaign featuring the Christian democracy leader and Prime Minister uh, Alcide de Gaspari uh, on its cover and in its lead story on 19th of April, 1948. Um, so again, this Wikipedia page saying very directly and unambiguously things that I feel like we're a little bit danced around in the actual entry. Do you agree? I feel like he could have been more direct and it's not as if this was like, you know, landmark, uh, fucking, you know, uh, breaking news. You know, I, I uncovered these documents. It's like, no, this is kind of not even news at this point you know you yeah. can be more direct the cia was involved I, I i get that like you know you wanna like kind of be level here or maybe you're just trying to be like very conservative about like you know events as they unfolded or something but it's just like it's not even just like conservative it's just like you're kind of missing like some of the context here that like you know um, so overall, the U.S. funneled 10 million to 20 million into the country for specifically uh, anti-PCI purposes. Additionally, millions of dollars for the Economic Cooperation Administration affiliated with the Marshall Plan were spent on anti-communist information activities. Like, we're going as far as here to not even just, like, uh, say that they dangled the aid over their head, but the aid was, like, explicitly, like, you have to use this on yeah. anti-communist activities. You know what I mean? I think yeah. that should be should be noted and i think i should be able to read that in this book i'm not trying to criticize the book because i love this book yeah. i think it's been stellar so far but just offering a little bit of criticism as i read through it because i read the book and then i read then when i start researching it and i find this wikipedia within a couple paragraphs i'm like holy shit they're just like yeah uh yeah all those letters forged like you know what i mean like it's like they're just saying like, oh, um, <laughs> not even real <laughs> not yeah. even written by real people <laughs> yeah 
Uh, the CIA claims that the PCI was being funded by the Soviet Union. According to Wyatt, the Communist Party of Italy was funded by black bags of money directly out of the Soviet compound in Rome, and the Italian services were aware of this. As the elections approached, the amounts grew, and the estimates are that 8 to 10 million a month actually went into the coffers of communism. Not necessarily completed completely to the party, Mr. D. Vittorio and labor was powerful, and certainly a lot went to him, according to a former CIA operative. Although the numbers are disputed, there is evidence that of some financial aid described as occasional and modest from the Kremlin. PCI official Pietro Sketchia and Stalin discussed financial support. So that kind of goes along with what Bloom said is that there was some like gestures that were made. And if we say that it was occasional and modest, like um, we're not dealing with anything as extreme. Well, as well, watch it. Watch it. Just be like, yeah, here's like three grand. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of uh, Goodfellas, when Paulie gives... Um, gives Henry Henry like just like what he has in his pocket yeah and he's like here and he looks out he's like crying while he's counting it like this is it this um, all I got the Christian Democrats eventually won the 1948 election with 48 percent of the vote and the uh, uh, FDP received 31 percent the CIA's practice of influencing the political situation was repeated in every Italian election for the next 24 years a leftist coalition would not win a general election for the next 48 years until 96 this was partly because of the italian's traditional bend for conservatism which is ridiculous that's such um, bullshit like and even what? more importantly the cold war with the u.s closely watching italy and their determination to the mainland to maintain a vital nato presence in the mediterranean um it's so ridiculous like why if they had a, a like a traditional bend for conservatism then why was all of that necessary R right not that I, uh, it kind of makes, the, the years of lead suddenly become like, you know, very like, you know what? Fuck this. We fought for like, you know, 10 fucking years against fascists. Why the fuck are we putting up with this shit? You know? And it literally, and it, it, it fucking, it took the, the U.S., Right, infiltrating these movements through fucking, you know, Gladio to even remove public support, you know, exactly. from the communists. So it's just like, it really, they technically never lost the support. It was just like, you know, literally false flags that caused them yeah. to lose the support. Yeah. An immense coercion through like fabricated, right. fabricated bullshit. Like, so like to say this little thing that like, oh, you know, the traditional bend for conservatism, it's like, no, that's no, not, that, that's bullshit not at all. That's like, bullshit. <laughs> Oh, by the way, you want to know who um, also tried to bring back the uh, the Italian Communist Party? Who? He was a very, very big, uh, you know, proponent. Yeah, he, he like, you know, especially like he's like there's you can find videos of him. He's like fucking got to be in his like 60s or 70s. And he's like, you know, talking about like the Soviet Union and Stalin and like the Italian Communist Party and shit. Freak, freak Museum, what's up? Sorry, I have to pee so bad. Nah, you're good. You're good. Is that even is it, do we have another slide even? No, that's it. That's it. Wow. I'm shocked. Yeah, these chapters, uh, I, I guess we should kind of like bask in the fact that like, you know, we're not taking like four hours to do these slides tonight. Um, we're not technically talking about Gladio. Like, Gladio has yet to be really implemented. We will get to that at later chapters in this book. But for right now, we were just talking about how um, the U.S. influenced the, like, you know, 47, 48 Italian elections, uh, and it literally through, through forgery, through bribery, through, you know, coercion of, of all kinds, um, you know. Yeah, we haven't even gotten yeah. to Gladio yet. No, we, yeah, yeah, this, this book is, is broken up into very specific sectors. So right now we're just dealing with 1947 and 1948. Gladio will be coming, there's a whole section on Gladio. Yes. We promised that Gladio will come up. It just hasn't come up yet. And, uh, you know, I was just telling chat that, like, you know, I, I guess we should kind of bask in these, like, you know, three and a half hour, you know, like, streams that we have for, like, these chapters. Because I have a feeling that, like, Wednesday, wh wh how many chapters are we doing? Just one or more? Wednesday, aren't we doing the uh, Great Father? Yeah. How many chapters did we agree to, though, with them? Well... With Rick, I think we said the first two. Okay, all right. Yeah, so yeah, I... We should de you should definitely reach out to him and just make sure. Okay, so I'll reach out to him and make sure. But I have a feeling that, like, that's going to be, like, a four-hour one. 
Yeah, so please keep in mind that we will be back on Wednesday, but we won't be covering Killing Hope. We'll be covering Great Father with Rick from Decolonized Buffalo. And Plants Fanon. And Plants Fanon. Um, and then on Sunday, let's take a look here, what we're probably going to be talking about. We're definitely... I think we're going to be talking about the Philippines and Greece. Um, depending on how many slides this breaks out to, um, it's hard for me to make promises because the chapters are so sh short, but they're so packed with information and sources that they turn into way more slides than a usual six ch six pages of reading that I do in like a regular regular book. So it's Greece and the Philippines, and then after that is Korea. So I could say pretty easily that it would be just Greece and the Philippines because Korea is so close to my heart that I'm not going to want to squeeze it in at the end i think it's going to need more um more of a highlight than that so greece is like five pages and then the philippines is like six pages and then korea is like 10 pages so yeah then we get to albania which is like this is the thing like albania is like i didn't even know that there was like a like a situation that happened there like that i mean considering that uh you know enver hoja i believe was still around i think i'm not that shocked by it right just eastern europe in general <laughs> mm -hmm. operation splinter factor iran is gonna be get down well. to western europe number 15 that's just, when we get in the gladio i believe yeah this sounds about right because mm -hmm. gladio does not mean something that just happened in italy yeah gladio is the term operation gladio is something that happened all through western europe well I think Gladio is the it's the other way around. Gladio is like the specific one for Italy, but like it's considered the strategy of tension for like, you know, throughout most of Europe or something. Um at least that's so the way Operation I... Gladio was the code name for clandestine stay behind operations of armed resistance that were organized by the Western Union and subsequently by NATO and the CIA in collaboration with several European intelligence okay. agencies during the Cold War. Although Gladio specifically refers to the Italian branch of the NATO Stay Behind organizations, Operation Gladio is used as an informal name for all of them. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So strap in. We still got several years before we even get to that. There's a lot that the CIA has done between now and then. Yeah, because we're going to be back in Italy a couple chapters, chapters from now, but we'll be back. Patrice Lumumba, fucking Cuba. Oh my God, this one is gonna be horrific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps going. Surprised? Where is? There we go. Afghanistan. Yeah, that's gonna be the one. Is Pol Pot mentioned in this do a, book? Do a control, there's, there's a section in Cambodia, I believe, but do a control F from Pol Pot. Let's see if it comes up. There, yep, there he is. The supporters of the Prince of uh, Sanuk. Shockingly, his name is only mentioned twice, but, you know, what are you going to do? Making you feel dizzy yet? What are we doing right now? We're just uh, we're going back up to the table contents. Yeah, I mean, like we're pretty much done. So you know, like whatever you want to do. This will be an interesting chapter with everything going on right now. Which one? Syria. Oh yeah, for sure. I read this book. And so much of this just kind of goes one ear out the other because it's not like a, um, a like the, it's not like the Jakarta method where every chapter is just d delving further and further yeah. into Indonesia, Indonesia, Indonesia. It's like you just spend six pages and then you're on to the next one. So going through it like the way we are now is like a really good way of getting it more um, committed to memory. Yeah. Skadoodle do. This one's going to be kind of fun, though. The uh, Indonesia War in Pornography. Do you know? Do you, you, uh, what am I talking about? You already read it. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, pretty much, Frank. It's uh, it's basically a CIA uh, speed run, you know, in terms of like everything they've done from like 1945 to, uh, you know, um, I think like the 90s, yeah. But um, yeah, it's like um, each of these situations can have a book about it. Like you yeah. could literally have a book on each of these things, and I do in many in many cir- many of these circumstances. But <laughs> this, like you said, is like a speed run of everything. You could do like a whole blowback season about every one of these. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh. Is there anything else you wanted to cover? Not really, man. I, I'm, I don't think I got any more gas left. I'm shot. I'm done. So yeah. So I guess tune in on Wednesday for Rick and Plans Vanon being on from uh and um <laughs> CIA actually has his book online and <laughs> it's also recommended by Osama bin Laden. Like a ghoulish C V. Oh, oh shit. Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Is that sound thing working yet? I I do not know why it's not working. I need to figure it the fuck out. I need to actually like hop on Streamlabs and try and figure out like what's going on with that. Like more than like 10 minutes before we were supposed to go on. I have to thank you. We have thank all you. the thanks in the world for you. Thank you so much, Frank. For your support. Oh, Frank also, wow. You guys are being so nice to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, no, I am. Uh, I'm, I think I'm done. So let's uh, let's let's see here. What have I got? What have I got? Johnny had a long day of carrying the subversive history flag <laughs> um, through his diplomatic missions. Yes, my various diplomatic missions across. Uh, multiple other streams. (laughs) I don't think I ever want to stream for this long, this many days in a row ever again. I don't know how all these other dudes do this seven days a week. All right, look, it's going to be, it's going to be horse. All right. That's just, that just is what it is. I don't have a problem with that in the content mines <laughs> content mines nah man I'm not on Twitter looking for fun new shit to do Fridays we, we do all of that just off the cuff alright I do it once lol the other stream is a playlist get in the tank chat we're going raiding alright give horse my love I'm getting the fuck out off of here cause I've been on here for too long um law salam chat stay strong out there say bye bye pat (laughs) uh later everybody thanks for all go good content for another black man we'll remember your contributions Stop recording.